everyone. This is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and I'm here for the weirdest missing persons case I know um, because it's never been solved and it makes very little sense to most people. And there's very, it's not like almost no clues. So people are still going, what the heck? It is a Springfield. <clears throat> it is the, I lost my voice. <laughs> uh, it's a Springfield three. These three women went missing out of a home in Springfield, Missouri in 1992, and they have never been found. Um, such a strange case. And I actually did some work on this case uh, in 2000. I was contacted by someone who was obsessed with this case. And so I learned about the case, and then I eventually talked with the, the mother of Stacey McCall, one of the victims, um, and Janice McCall, and we had back and forth quite a bit, and um, I learned a lot of details. I then contacted uh, the detective on the case. He was very interested in having me work on the case, but as often happens in police departments, one detective thinks it's a great idea. He goes to the, <laughs> the boss, and they're like, eh, outsiders? No, we're working the case. And so I unfortunately did not have the opportunity I would have liked to have had to get some of, not more of the clues because the clues are very few and I'm gonna give them to you, but more of the background information that I needed and the interviews, I would have liked to have seen them. Uh, witnesses or people claiming things, I would like to have the full information on them. Okay, so getting to this case. All right, just a minute. I wanna say hello to everyone who is in the chat room and I wanna say <laughs> um, a very nice people in the chat room and we, this is a second, I just, oh, look, I have, it's glitching again. We are having a glitching problem and I've changed, I've actually changed servers on this and um, it's still glitching. So I'm going to try not to move too much because it seems like it glitches when I move and I have no idea why I'm, I'm linked in. I've already changed from Google Chrome to Microsoft to see if that would change things. And I have no idea. Maybe it's a Verizon issue going on today but I'm not going to restart again, but um, I appreciate everybody coming back for the reboot uh, because it was so bad before that I was like, yeah, let's not, let's, let's see if we can start the show again. <laughs> and so we have, so thank you all for coming back. I really appreciate that. Um, by the way, if you'd like to be in, in the chat room, um, uh, please do click on the link below to Patreon. Um, uh, Patreon supports this channel quite well, uh, you know, because uh, <clears throat> Uh, advertising revenue from uh, YouTube is eh, kind of small. So, you know, everybody who supports a channel, it's five bucks a month. I have one level only because uh, I like everybody to be a community. Um, eight lives a month you can participate in and five bucks a month supports the channel. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, it's okay. You can uh, please just subscribe to the channel, like, hit the bell for notifications. And um, if you want to support the channel another way, you can always buy one of my books. <laughs> Click the little dollar sign. It's an educational channel, which is one of the reasons I do bring this up uh, because I, I'm not a gossip channel. Uh, and so, and I'm not a grifter channel. So I do specific cases uh, for the purposes of education. And therefore, I, I probably cut my income like 90%. <laughs> it's okay with me. I'm good with, I'm going good with doing what I do. So what I want to get to, uh, I also want to mention, by the way, just because uh, everybody is so lovely and, and oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> um, wow. Oh, just a small glitch, Benny. A very small glitch. You're clear and pretty as usual. Oh, Benny, you're so nice. I love Benny. And by the way, Benny, yes, I did get your email and your thoughts are very reasonable uh, about this particular case. Um, so I also want to point out, you know, we're here. We're here. This is just something new. Someone said to me this important point. As I've had more, we have more pat patrons than I've had before. I, one of the reasons I don't have an open cha open uh, chat room to the entire public is because it goes insane with bots and crazy people and 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 haters and it just gets really nasty. So I have a, a smaller group and you all have been great. But I do want to mention as we get bigger. Please keep on topic. This is a criminal profiling education channel. I don't want any politics here, any religion here, and too much outside chit chat about things that have nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Mm, you know, it makes it makes it difficult. Also, because I want to see your comments. I want to know what you. If you're asking a question, you have a comment. I want to know that. And if there's too much 
kind of nonsense chatting going on. Um, I can't see it. So I don't, I don't have somebody to come in here and monitor everything. So be good. <laughs> okay. Now I have a question for you. As I start the channel, somebody pointed this out, uh, the Springfield three, I'm going to describe this in a minute, but I want you to be thinking about this because this is an educational channel. And this case is <laughs> talk about educational. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, I really want participation here as to thoughts on this, because this is definitely an unsolved case and a very confusing one. And um, I want your thoughts along the way. I'm going to stop at certain points and say, okay, what would you think in these circumstances? So the first question I want to ask you is this. Three women were kidnapped out of their home, out of her home. Uh, let me, let, okay, let me read you the basics on the case. The Springfield Three from Wikipedia, I always give my sources, <laughs> the Springfield Three refers to an unsolved missing person case that began on June 7th, 1992, when friends, Susan, Susie Streeter, they call her Susie, uh, and, her, and her friend, Stacy McCall, and Streeter's mother, this is Susie's mom, her mom is Cheryl Levitt, went missing from Levitt's home in Springfield, Missouri. At all of their personal belongings, including their cars and their purses, were left behind. There were no signs of a struggle. The only sign of anything weird was a, a broken porch light globe. And there was also a message on the answering machine later on after the women already disappeared, when one of their friends had picked up the phone when it rang after they came to the home to, what the heck happened to these women? Uh, we're, you know, we're, they were coming, their friend was coming to the home to pick up these two to go have a good time at, a, at a, an amusement park, um, water park, and they weren't there. So the phone rang, she picked it up, it was some weird pervert dude. And so that was like it. And that was it. They, they, they Nothing. Okay. That's the basics of this. But since this is going to, uh, during the show, since you all have access to your computers as well, um, and maybe, you know, like me, you have a, a laptop and an iPad and an iPhone. <laughs> you got lots of hands, like, like a Hindu goddess. <laughs> and if you're Benny, a Hindu god. Okay, so um, uh, Benny said, am I the only <laughs> rooster in the hen house? Yeah, Benny, you know, it is a truth that true crime pulls in women far more than it pulls in men. So yeah, there are a lot of women here and <laughs> once in a while we have the lone dude. Today, Benny, you're the rooster. Very nice rooster. And I say that because we have a hen house outside this house of mine and we have two roosters in, in two different sections. And I will not go in there because those roosters do not like me. They attack me <laughs> and um, they cause damage. Mm. So you're the good rooster. Anyway. <laughs> I want to point this out. I forgot who just said this because we were on the, the last show and one of you mentioned, because I was going to ask this question. Think about this through the whole show. If this was a serial killer who abducted these three women for the purposes of sexual enjoyment, how many cases do you know where a serial killer went to a home abducted three people out of the home and and did something to them. I, I don't care if they were found or not found. That's not the issue, uh, whether the bodies are found or whatever. But how many cases do you know? Because to me, I'm going to point out the reason why I'm asking this question. This is extremely unusual. Now, one of you, and, I, and I, because we changed, I can't remember your name. If you're here and you want to say it was me, say it was me, um, mentioned this particular case. Uh, Texas girl, Texas girl, with you. Okay, the Fort Worth missing trio. Wait, hold on a second. I'm getting dingy things. Hold on. I, what? I have, sorry. <laughs> I have my phone on silent, but it dings anyway. Seriously, why would it ding when it's on silent? That's, that's, oh, for God's sakes. I'm going to, sorry. You hear that? Stop dinging. I'm going to throw the, I just threw the phone across the room. Okay. <laughs> It's on silent and it still dings. Driving me crazy. All right. Phone okay. All right. It's on the other side of the room now. I have a carpet. I'm not an idiot. I'll throw it on tile. <laughs> it's a carpet. Okay. Uh, so Texas girl, was that you who said this? 
The Fort Worth Missing Trio refers to unsolved missing persons cases on December 23, 1974, when three girls uh, went missing while Christmas shopping. Uh, the, girl, the, the car the girls were driving was left behind in a Sears parking lot, and they vanished. So that was a great point. This was not in a home. This was two gr th three girls kidnapped in a parking lot. Um, <laughs> Cantina says, mine does that too. Yeah, if you have it on silent, shouldn't, shouldn't text be silent as well? Wouldn't you think? All right. Oh, uh, come on. I didn't want to turn off my notifications. I just want them to be silent. Anyway, uh, I'll find out who that was later. Um, live is fun, you know. Never know what happens. Okay, so Texas girl, I, I like what you said because you found a case that you thought was reminiscent of this. Uh, out of a uh, three girls kidnapped in a parking lot, three teens kidnapped in a parking lot. So that's that's an interesting one. Um, oh wait a minute, which one is this? Biggest difference, Yosemite case. Uh, the signs of a struggle in a hotel room. I, I'm not concerned about the struggle issue. I'm going to get to that in this case. I'm I'm looking at the point of three women is a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot. You know, when you can get one, it's easier. Can you get two sometimes? Sure, under certain circumstances. But the question is, why three? And this is going to be very. No, the Memphis three are children. That has nothing to do with anything, and that that's completely nothing to do with this case whatsoever. I'm talking about a serial killer that chooses three women to sexually assault and, and as opposed to picking a house with one woman or grabbing somebody off the street. This is important to me. Um, as far as, uh, this is also interesting. Benny says, uh, serial killers usually kill, just kill the victims in the house they break into. And you're thinking of a, a combo where you have a bunch of people you know, a bunch of people who are attacked. Denny Rowling is, is probably a good example of that. Um, he came in, he killed, uh, one case he killed uh, a father, a son, and then he raped a woman. Another case he attacked two women. Another case, he, there was a guy and a woman in the house. He killed the guy, killed, raped and killed the woman. He was busy, but in the house, not abducted. So this is an interesting thing. So all right, let me get to the case. Um, and let me explain where I got some information from. Um, all right, so I always do that besides Wikipedia, which is my just my outline. I, I use it just for that reason, not because it's good, <laughs> but it is a, is, a, is a useful outline. All right, so hold on. Oh, my goodness and a half. Hold, hold on a second. Well, this is interesting. <laughs> Hold on a second. When you change browsers, which is what I did to prevent this issue, for some freaky reason, it also removes all the things that you had on previously to put on the screen. See, people have no idea how nonsensically difficult this crap is. Oh, Lord. And I have people go, oh, it's, it's because you're an old lady. You don't know what you're doing electronically. No. It's because it's it's a pain in the ass. Okay, here we go. I, I just moved everything over. Hmm. Okay, so this is a very good one. Uh, link below when you're watching this video. Uh, this is done. This was done fairly recently, but it is a 2017 uh, documentary um, by a, a news channel, essentially. Three missing women and a quarter century of questions. Very well done. You'll see what all the cases about. And you'll see, the, no, no, like Stacey McCall's mom is going to be on there. A few other people. Um, very well done. I watched that first. Um, one of the weird things about this whole case was um, I've had a lot of suggestions to do this case. And it, it sat in the back of my head because, I, you know, okay, it's 2023 and this was 1990s. And I worked on this case in 2000. And when I say worked on I'm not trying to lie about this. I worked on it in the sense of I was interested in it and the mother of one of the victims did contact me and we just we went through discussions on it and I contacted the detective. I never got further. So let's just be clear about that. There are cases I work with police departments. There are cases I worked outside of police departments and there are cases I work with nobody at all except for what's on the internet like you. Um, 
but I knew I had some information on this case. So <laughs> I have like six hard drives. <laughs> so I'm not going through my hard drives and I cannot find the freaking information on this case. I'm like, I know I did something on this thing, but it's been 20, 20 years. I don't remember that long ago. So I finally, finally found the hard drive with the information on it through many, many searches. And lo and behold, I found my emails to um, Stacy's mom, Janice, Janice McCall. I found my emails to the detective. I found the emails, all the stuff that built up and the things I had said in, re in reply, my thoughts on the case. So I was like, oh, thank God. So I went through all of that first. And then Benny, thank you, Benny. Benny gave his thoughts on the case. So, and Benny's always, Benny, by the way, is quite a decent profiler, I must admit. Um, very, very logical in his thinking and um, had his, has had some thoughts on this case. So he mentioned he had gone to Ken Main's uh, uh, channel and um, had reviewed his, view, uh, his analysis of the case. Now, some of you know I've had one issue with Ken Main's. It's only one. He brought on a, a killer that he pre presented as a, like a, a great guy who had great information and can profile in his own right. And I'm look, I researched that guy and that guy's a psychopathic, lying, manipulative creep. And I was appalled that it was on his channel. And I was appalled that he was presenting him as something worthwhile. Now, behind the scenes, if you want to chat with this dude and learn from him, fine. But to put him on, on 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 his channel and have everybody saying, "Oh my God, he's the most wonderful guy, he's so brilliant," garbage, uh, not not true at all. And his stuff on Delph, uh, what was it, uh, on, uh, Idaho, was nonsense. So anyway, I had an issue over that, and I spoke boldly about that, and was not received well by certain folks. Anyway, but I've always said because I like to be reasonable with a baby in the bathwater thing. I like, generally speaking, Ken Main's channel as opposed to the grifter channels out there. When I say grifters, I mean the gossip channels, the people who have no background, who claim things that are, are garbage, who point fingers and, and do a video every 50 videos, like 50 videos on this case, and they don't know crap. Uh, and Ken Maines does not do that. He looks at a particular case. He gives his analysis. I have always approved of that. And I spoke quite well of him until I, you know, this issue with the, uh, the killer that he brought on his channel as a faux profiler. That bugged me tremendously. Um, he should know better, but I, I, the rest of his channel, I'm okay with. All right. Um, so the reason I say that is because I want people to be able to access different professionals opinions. All right. Um, some people trash Dr. Grande. Uh, I think he's not the greatest crime scene analyst, but he has a lot of psychological viewpoints and he's kind of amusing. So I'm like, okay, listen to what he has to say. See if he has some validity in his, his, his analysis. Same thing with Doc, uh, Ken Maines. Um, I, you know, he's a detective. You're going to get a, a viewpoint from a detective. If he explains things, good. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And in this particular case, uh, so I went to, I did look at it, Springfield 3, uh, real cold case, detective's opinion. Um, we have very different views on this case. <laughs> but again, it's okay. And what I want you to do, because I think this is it will be interesting experiment and an experience too. Um, and this is a learning experience. I'm here to educate. I'm not here to pronounce. Okay. So Ken Maines has a viewpoint. I have a viewpoint. I'm going to argue with some of his viewpoints, but I would love for you to go over to his channel and, and get his viewpoint. Now, mind you, I want to say this right up front. I do not approve of anyone going to his channel and trashing him. I don't approve of people coming to my channel and trashing me. That you know, if you don't if you don't agree with somebody on their channel, shut the hell up. <laughs> you know it's just rude. Just you know you go over there, you listen. If you pre appreciate what they have to say and you want to say something, or you want to have a question, or you want to whatever, that's fine. But if you're just rude, just go away. You know, um, and I don't think that's right. So I don't want anybody doing that because that's just that's unacceptable. I I, I did. I disapprove heavily of what he did with the killer, but he is one of the few channels out there who generally speaking does analyze cases. And whether I always agree with him is not my point. We just have so few professionals who analyze that we can start learning from. Now, in this case, I disagree with him heavily on a lot of things, which just turned out, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But I'm going to point these things out and then you can think about it and um, 
this is how we learn. Okay. So, and one of the things happens here is that I know he doesn't know some of the things I know. And I say this because this happens to me. It's like, I can analyze a case. And then <laughs> after I make a fool of myself, <laughs> you know, I analyze it and somebody comes back and goes, well, what about this? I'm like, wow, I wish I had known that. <laughs> can I get rid of what I said? You know, um, that's the problem. Most of the time, detectives, profiles work behind the scenes as a team, well, theoretically as a team, and they keep things quiet because as information comes in, they may have to change their, their analysis, their theories. And, you know, once you go public with it and put it on YouTube, you know, you kind of like, you know, <laughs> why I look bad now. Um, so yes, I did look at his and it was a uh, interesting because I disagree with some of the things that his conclusions and where they came from. Some, I think is through lack of information. Some, I'm not quite sure I understand where it came from, but I'm, I want you to look at both of our opinions and then you can, you can um, learn from them and you can say where you think, Oh, where do you think Pat Brown is maybe more accurate? Maybe you think Ken Maynes is more accurate. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do here. All right. So what happened with these ladies? Um, Oh, <laughs> well, this is true. People on the internet can be horrible trolls. Yeah, this is, you know, it, it, it's funny because Ken May did just put out a, a video where he just, he had no comments on it. He's just losing his mind going, I hate these true crime channels. And I agree with them entirely on that, that video. I agree with them. It, it's, it's pretty miserable. Um, and it, it's not, uh, it's not nice. Um, but it's a, it's a free for all. And what we can do is try to just, wherever we are, try to be more rational and try to learn. Because this is, this is what we're here for. I mean, what's the point of the other stuff? Just to make ourselves, you know, I was so right. <laughs> but I, I want to, um, I want to make, I want to make this an educational experience. So here we go. Did anybody, I'll have to look back now. Did anybody come up with another case where three women were abducted or out of a house and were for sexual purposes and murdered. Um, dreadful case in Canada. Um, couple was abducted from the home and murdered. I'm trying to think which one that is. Now, I'm not talking about personal murders. That's a whole different thing. Like the Ketty, Ketty murders. I don't think that was sexual. Um, so there's, there's reasons there are people murdered and kidnapped and all this kind of stuff, but not necessarily by a serial killer. This is, this is my point. Uh, a serial killer. Uh, Car Carrie Stainer, did he abduct women, uh, three women out of a house, or did he, was he just a serial killer? I mean, we got a lot of serial killers out there, and they kill women in houses. Um, so there's a lot of those. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about, uh, okay, I'm going to explain why. All right, let me get to the case so we don't lose reason why I'm doing, saying these things. All right. So now what happened with these, with these three women? All right. What happened was this. All right, so you got mom was home. All right, let me let me let me just read the stuff here so I get you basic. On the morning of December twenty, I'm in the wrong case. <laughs> Sorry, that's a Fort Worth one. Wait a minute. Oops. Okay. <laughs> let me read the right Wikipedia page. All right, Streeter and McCall. I can't get my fit. Streeter and McCall graduated from Kickapoo High School on June 6, nineteen ninety two. They were last seen at 2 a.m. Now, this is now the time frame is very important. Timing, location, the issue about the broken broken uh, globe off of the uh, outside light. These things are important, and so I'm going to go through them. All right. They were last seen at 2 a.m. on June 7th when they were leaving the last of the few graduation parties they had attended that evening. Okay, the, the pair, these two, planned to spend the night at their friend Janelle Kirby's house. But it was so crowded. They had a lot of relatives over. It was so crowded. They instead left to go to Streeter's, Streeter's house, um, uh, which was also her mom's house. They lived together, the two of them. There was no male in the house. The, she, the, she was divorced. Uh, she had a brother. I'll get into him later. Uh, he was not living there. So it was just the two of them in this new house. Actually, they had moved there about two months prior. And mom was home painting up stuff and make, doing a lot of doing work on furniture and stuff. She had been home 
and she had called somebody about 11 o'clock that night and was talking to chatting away with them. She was at home. Okay. They were not at home. Uh, she was not at home. She was out with her friend partying. And then they decided you can't stay at this place. So we're going to go back and just stay at, at now. She said to the stamp mom, let's stay at my house. Okay. So they went there to retire for the night. It is assumed they arrived because, all right, take a look at this picture. Uh, they arrived because their clothing, jewelry, purses, and vehicles. And there's a picture of their vehicles. These are the two girls' vehicle. This is Susie's vehicle, and this is Stacy's vehicle. In the house, you can't see it here very well, is mom's vehicle. That's a blue, a blue, a small blue car. Small blue car in the carport. And uh Susie's car here, Stacy's car behind her. She followed her home. This is a, this is a fact. Okay. So they left at two o'clock from the party. They went to the house. It took about 20, 30 minutes. So they went to the house. So at least two 30, they were at home. Then there was evidence in the bathroom. They had taken off their makeup. They got ready for bed. Uh, uh, Stacy had piled her clothes up on her shoes. She had like, you know, she had her shoes there. She piled up some clothes on top of her shoes. So they were like in a bed close. They were both sleeping in uh, Susie's new water bed. I guess it was a big enough water bed. So they were sleeping there. There was a TV on. Uh, and an interesting point has made, uh, Ken Maines made about this, which I just, I, I disagreed with, that she, uh, Susie had issues sleeping at night. She was an insomniac. So she had to have the TV going so she could fall asleep. And the, so the, the TV was on, but the sound was down. So one thing Ken Maine said is he thought she heard something outside, so she turned the sound down. I, I'm not disagreeing with him because it couldn't have happened. I'm disagreeing with him because it isn't the only thing that could happen. She also has her friends sleeping in the bed with her. And her friend could go, could you turn the TV down? <laughs> so I don't know which one it is. I'm just going to leave that open. Did, did they hear some, did, did Susie hear something and turn the sound down and then go check things, something out? Would she need to turn the sound down to check something out? Or was the sound turned down because her friend was playing in bed next to her and was annoyed by it? So don't jump to conclusions that this is the only answer. So you have to always keep the two things in mind. So anyway, the girls were in bed. Okay. Whether they were asleep, we don't know, but this was so by to, they were like home at 2.30. They had to get ready for bed. That probably took 30 minutes. So 3 o'clock, 3 a.m., everything was fine. Mom was there. They were in the bed. The cars were in the driveway and in the carport. Keep the 3 o'clock in mind. All right. Then, next, what happened next was, uh, the following day around 9 a.m., Kirby, that's 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 her friend, and her boy and her boyfriend visited the house after Streeter and McCall failed to show up at her home because they were going to go to a water park in Branson, have fun, a fun day, you know, and they never showed. So they went over her friend and her boy and the friend's boyfriend went to the house. Okay. So now they're at the house. And when they arrived, they noticed that there's a, there's a, there's, this is a, this is a, 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 a light on the, you know, outside the door. It had, had a bulb in it, but the globe around the bulb, however it was supposed to be on there, was smashed on the ground. And uh, they, they saw that um, uh, and the door was unlocked. The front door was unlocked right there next to that lot. The front door was unlocked. Um, and but nobody seemed to be there. All right. But all the cars were there. And then they saw the glass, the, the, the glass was all over the ground. So the boyfriend just picked up a broom and kind of swept that crap up. People accuse him of destroying his crime scene. I mean, you know, there's glass all over the place. He just, he was trying to be nice. You know, this is ridiculous. He wasn't messing anything up. He just was trying to clean up something. Um, but it's interesting because I don't, the problem we have is it would be nice to know whether the glass was all in one place or the glass was spread out so that we'd know if the ladies left by the front door with bare feet that they would have crossed glass or they wouldn't have crossed glass. Would it have been useful for him not to have swept up the glass? Yes. He didn't. He didn't do it to be mean, you know, to screw up the crime scene. So anyway, they didn't find the people at home. And they were like, what the heck? You know, where are they? They should be here. Um, 
and also everything else was there. Their purses were there, their jewelry was there, the clothing, nothing seemed out of line except the women weren't there. Um, and then there was a the phone rang and one of the, the girl, the girl answered it and it was supposedly some guy saying creepy shit, you know, and like creep call, you know, hang up on him. Then what happened was, all right, the dog was there, by the way, they had a little, little puppy and the puppy was just running around barking. It's a little thing. Um, and so cinema was there. Uh, so they had, a, the, they answered the, the girl, the girl answered a strange and disturbing call from an unidentified male who made sexual innuendos and she hung up several hours later, McCall's mother, Janice, this is Janice McCall, who I was in contact with. This is her back in the day. And this is her now, uh, Janice McCall worried about her daughter, you know, who went to stay at her friend's house visited the home after failed attempts to reach her daughter by phone. She noticed all three women's purses were there. And this is, this is a very interesting thing. Okay. So over here, the three purses were in a row together. They were, this is a little confusing. And if you haven't understood the crime, this is where it was. The, Susie's, Susie's room was next to the carport. And there were some steps and the three bags were like near the steps or on the steps. It was kind of a strange place for them to be. Um, now, one thing that Ken Maines talks about is he wonders whether the women were taken out the back door or and there's a car, there's also a door in the carport. I don't think he mentioned that, but he thought the back door um, because there was, um, let's see if I can find a picture of that or it vanished on me. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, you can, you can sort of see this is the house. See the cars in the driveway, and then you see there's a fence. So he didn't know where the yard was fenced in, which is reasonable because if you're not there and you can't see the photos, it's so frustrating. He didn't know if there was a door going out of the, like they could have been taken out the back door and then they went through a door in the fence so that the guy didn't have to park out here because they were taken away. But some wasn't with their cars. Three women weren't taken away on foot. They were taken away in a vehicle. So did they did that person pull up in the driveway here and just park? Or did they park somewhere nearby and then didn't heard the women, didn't heard the women out the front door, but heard them out the back door. Uh, Ken Maines thinks, well, if there was glass on the front porch, he would, they, they would have cut their feet and there would be blood out there. But again, we don't know how the glass was. Um, he thought maybe they were taken out the back door. Reasonable thought. However, from my, my contact with uh, 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 Janice McCall back in 2000 and the other people, uh, information I had gotten. Apparently all doors to the house were locked. The back door, the, and the door even to the carport was locked. So the only unlocked door was the front door, which makes you think they were, did indeed go out the front door. So uh, that's an interesting point. So anyway, the mom's looking around. She's like, why the heck are three, the three bags here in a row? And that is one of the curious parts about this because why would they be in a row on the steps essentially? Did they pick them up and plan to leave with them? And then somebody said, leave them there. Uh, did somebody pick up all, say, give me all your bags and get all the bags and look at them. There was money in those bags, especially the mom. She, she, uh, she was a hairdresser and she had a lot of tips and money from the organization. She, uh, or business, she had a lot of money in that bag, like hundreds. And it was, it was still there. Um, some people think it's drug money and there's whole drug claims of drug stuff. And there's no proof of this that I know of. So I, I won't even go there that mom was involved in drugs. I, I have no proof of that. Um, but did, if somebody, why didn't, if they took the bags and looked in them, why wouldn't you take the money? I mean, you're going to kidnap the women and might as well take the money, women, the money too. Or did, the, did somebody say to them, we're going to go for a little ride, even though you're half dressed and they got, grabbed the bag and then said, no, you don't need them. The cigarettes were left there. Um, apparently, um, if you look at the three ladies, um, Mom and Susie were heavy smokers. And if they were going for a long ride and thought they, they were, hey, can we take our cigarettes? No. Um, so everything was left. So let's go on. Um, mom, while mom was there, she also answered the phone and got a, some perverted dude. And she hung up. And the, the, the message was, a, there was a message or something that was erased. So, or she heard something that was erased. And so that piece of information went out the door along with the women. Um, so that's it. Essentially, that's it. So 
we come down to these issues. And now, Ken Maines talks about that at 1, 1 a.m., somewhere around there, a neighbor saw a peeping Tom looking through a neighbor's window on that night. And he strongly believes that this person was the one who abducted the three women. He furthermore goes on to say that he thinks the peeping Tom is a, is a sex predator and their sick uh, peeping toms are sex predators therefore he kidnapped the three women and it was not a coincidence he talks about coincidence and he says well it's this is not a coincidence this is related absolutely and i don't know where he gets that from i mean first of all i never heard about this in 2000 i never heard about any peeping tom ever from from her mom I never heard a word of it from any place from the never did I hear about a peeping tongue. I don't even know if this is a valid statement. Somebody somewhere said, oh, I saw some guy looking in the window. Now, maybe the police discounted it because they actually didn't have the night. They maybe they called in weeks later and or months later and said, uh, I saw this guy. And they said, what day was it? Well, I'm not really sure. Could have been a teenager trying to get in his house. It could have been, I don't know, it could have been anything. But we don't have any proof, A, that it's valid, and B, that it was a true peeping Tom. And three, here's something I really want to point out. Yes, it is true that peeping Toms, you shouldn't ignore them because peeping Toms often escalate to become rapists or escalate to become serial killers because they're already, peeping Toms are people who want to invade your space. They want to see you. They want to get close to you. And they may then break into your house and put, you know, take your underwear or put your gum in your underwear drawer, anything that they can to invade your space. Peeping toms are dangerous in that sense, but they usually escalate. I find it a little hard that a peeping tom escalates to kidnapping three women that same evening. Really? I mean, that's that's a lot. I'm, I'm not sure I believe that. Um, three women is a lot. I mean, you know, compared to peeping in somebody's window. Um, and of course, we don't even know that this happened. Um, a lot of times peeping toms are local. They don't even have a vehicle to work with. And obviously, whoever took these three women had a vehicle. And I'll get to the issue of the vehicle in a minute. Um, there's just absolutely no proof. And also, the, the, the man was seen peeping supposedly at one, one o'clock in the morning. These women were at least weren't taken till three. What was he doing the other two hours? I mean, first of all, um, uh, Ms. Levitt was home alone. She was home alone. So, hey, if you're going to grab somebody and, you know, there's no cars in the driveway. Look back at the driveway. These two cars weren't there at one o'clock in the morning. Supposedly, this peeping Tom was only three, three houses down. All he has to do is peep in. If he's peeping into her house, he sees her painting stuff and whatever. Her car is in the garage. And all he sees is one woman alone. I mean, if you're going to attack somebody, that's the time to do it. Not when there's two more cars in the driveway and you don't know who's in those two cars. It could be a, it could be a big dude. You know what I mean? You could be walking into, you know, uh, if you don't know who actually lives there, who's coming home, it could be a, you could be up against men as well. And would you really, is that really where you're going with it? I mean, I, yeah, no, it doesn't really work for me. So now uh, I want to talk about the timing so we have a Cheryl, a Cheryl Levitt, the mom. She was home until two, at least 2.30 in the morning alone. If she was the target of the crime, this, whoever it is, had all evening, if he was peeping in windows or if he was just, or if he was somebody after her, he had all 2.30 in the morning. Nobody was there. At all. Now, one of the one of the suspects in the case. Let me show you some of the suspects. One of the suspects was her son Bart. Um, Bart was a mess, messed up dude. <laughs> okay, he admits it. He's a screw up. Uh, she had kind of cut cut him off. Um, so the theory might some people have is that he came back to kill her and his sister so that they could and get I don't know, insurance money or I, I who knows in the will. But anyway, 
Here's the thing. When they were they were taken, look again at the at this this thing. He knows his mother drives a blue car. He knows she's home. He knows Stacy, I'm sorry, uh, Susie drives a red car. He knows she's home. Then there's another car in the driveway. Is this really the time that Bart, the son, is going to pick? Why? What would be the point? Why couldn't he do it when just mom and mom was home alone or mom and daughter, sis, sis were home alone? So the fact that he would wait till there's an extra person in the house and he doesn't even know who that extra person is makes no sense. So I've, I've never been fond of the Bart, the Bart concept at all. Uh, because it just really doesn't make sense. So, but then let's go back and look at this. All right. So mom's home alone to 2 a.m. But somebody waits until her daughter pulls in. Now, Stacy was not supposed to be there at all. Now, who would then choose that moment to go in when there's an extra vehicle there. Um, that's interesting to me. Um, as far as a serial killer goes, sure, does he, is he excited he can get more than one? Maybe, but you know, usually they go for what's easier. <laughs> usually, especially when you're talking about abducting. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, he had one by herself. I mean, admittedly, she was in her 40s, so I guess maybe she wasn't good enough. But, you know, maybe he was waiting for... I, here's the thing. The, the, the kidnapping occurred after the daughter got home. In my opinion, that is the key. I think she was the target. Now, why she was a target becomes another issue. But I think if somebody wanted mom, she was home alone for all that time. If it was just a stranger coming through the neighborhood, again, why would you, you wouldn't even know if you were just a stranger peeping in windows or just uh, some serial killer driving through, you wouldn't even know if there wasn't say two dudes in the house that might shoot you. You know, you don't, you're not in a big rush. You can always grab somebody else. So to me, I feel like the person knows who lives here, the mom and Susie. They did not expect Stacy, but they waited till Susie got home. And for whatever reasons, they felt this is the time I'm going to take these ladies. So that timing thing is, is a big deal to me. The next thing we come to is the broken, the broken uh, globe over the, the light light. And now this is an interesting problem because what, what Ken Mains didn't know, and I, I can't blame him on this one, from what I know. Now, I'm not saying my information is correct. He thinks that this could have been an accident or have nothing to do with anything. Um, some people think that the globe was broken. Let me think how to say this. Um, the globe was broken, and the intent was to break the light, too, so that no light would be there. Ken Mains thinks the light was on because it was nighttime. He thinks his wife didn't happen later in the day because the light was on. And therefore, um, that's why the person went to break this. Um, but, the, but from what I know, from back in 2000, what I was told was the actual bulb didn't work, <laughs> that there was a problem with the whole damn light, that the bulb did not work. So the light was not on. However, it is possible that whoever arrived at the house thought that the light had simply been turned off. The light bulb and the something I think Ken Mains does not know either. Uh, at least this, is, this again is information I have from 2000. And I'm not blaming him on this. I'm just saying if you don't know things, this is to throw you off. The light bulb was turned. So it appears to me, since I was told that the light wasn't working, somebody thought, I'm going to turn the light bulb. And therefore, when somebody comes to the door and flips the switch on, it won't light up. Now, somebody also mentioned this possibility that the globe was not properly like the nail. They know you have these little screws and they weren't in there and they fell accidentally. Possible. I don't know if the person broke it or it fell accidentally when they were trying to screw the thing. And the thing was just badly put in because the whole, there was a whole problem with the whole setup. But it does appear to me this thing. 
that whoever did it didn't want the person to see who they were when they came to the door. Now, some people also think, and this is not an unreasonable thought, that the globe was broken, purposely dropped on the ground to, so that whoever was inside would hear the glass breaking and would right, wake them up and make them go, what the hell, and go to the door and open it up. And that is possible. But again, somebody turned that bulb because they did not want to be identified or seen and right away. Now, a total stranger, I don't know, that's really important to them. <laughs> I mean, if you're a total stranger, it's like you thought, well, you wanted to pretend you weren't, like you were somebody they knew, so you turned the light off, so they wouldn't realize that it was a stranger? Well, I guess maybe. Or was it you actually didn't want them to see who you were because they might not want to open the door if they saw you. Is that the problem? So this, this becomes an interesting point. So we can discuss that further. So the timing, who, they, who, the, who, was, the, uh, who was the target? The, the, um, the, the globe issue here. Everything was left in place. The women were herded out. So I assume somebody did have to have a, a, a gun, okay? Now, let me point out something else. I'm going to go and start getting your ideas on this case because it is so weird. I mean, it's like it's not like an easy case to understand. Um, there was a person about, mm, I guess it was like 6.30 in the morning. Now, this, came, this again is some, some very questionable crap. Uh, somebody about 6.30 in the morning, a neighbor, somebody fairly close to where they lived, Claim they saw this van. It was called a white van. Then it was called a silver van. Then it was called a green, green, mossy van. It changed a lot. And I've heard different stories about this. I've heard that it was like 17 days later, somebody came forward with it. And then I heard that they actually didn't see it, that they were hypnotized. They saw something and were hypnotized and came up with this. But the claim is that this person pulled into the driveway and like, and, and there was a woman behind the wheel that looked like Susie. All right. Look like Susie. Um, this, this is Susie Streeter. Look like her freaking out behind the wheel, crying. And uh, this person heard a voice that said, don't do anything stupid or silly. Turn around and get us out of here. Back up and get us out of here. Like the turn, like the, she had made a mistake when she turned in the wrong place and had to turn around to go to the highway or whatever. Now, 630. How dark. So somebody saw her. So it wasn't dark at that time. So I don't know when these women were kidnapped, but they were they kidnapped at 530 in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. But they had, they had to be clear, they really late. Then you wonder why would anybody be turning a light off if there's already light out? So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the timing that she was driving, supposedly driving this vehicle uh, in daylight. OK, af after the sun had risen. But now there's something interesting about this now. Here's the other thing. So the women were kidnapped in some vehicle, which wasn't their own vehicle. A van is not unreasonable to think because you have to have at least three people and a kidnapper or three people and two kidnappers. Now, why would Sue, this, by the way, in case you wonder about that van picture, this one, <laughs> the police found this van or painted it or whatever and, and, and took a picture of it so people would look for this kind of vehicle. All right. So supposedly Susie's driving this. Now, one thing I didn't couldn't find out about the vehicle, is it automatic or is it a stick? Now, how important is that? Got three women. Who drives a stick? Now, I drive a stick. Most of my friends do not drive a stick. So when you have when you if you have a kidnapper forcing one of the women to drive the vehicle, which uh, right away tells me that you only have one kidnapper if that's true because personally if i had a if i were kid if there were two dudes and i'm i'm kidnapping women one of the dudes is going to be driving and the other one is going to be in the back of the vehicle with a gun on three women because i want a trustworthy person behind the wheel who's going to get us where we're going i don't want to depend on a completely freaked out kidnapped woman to drive properly who's not going to freak out and drive into a tree or do it on purpose as well. Um, because, and even if they're, okay, you got a gun. Let's say you got Susie up front and the one guy's in the back with them too. And he's like, I'm going to kill your friend and your mom if you screw up. Don't screw up. Well, okay, I get that. You could do that if you're the one person. But you better be sure of these three. 
that you pick the one who can actually drive the vehicle. Look at the vehicle. That's a that's a big a big van. Supposedly, a, you know, that's the way it supposedly looked. If if you believe the the witness, who I'm not sure I believe, but let me tell you, if you these women, all three women drove little cars. I drive I drive a Mazda Miata. And then sometimes I drive my daughter's car, which is a larger car, to take my granddaughter around in. And have I driven a truck? Have I driven a van? Yes. Do I like doing it? No, because on a general basis, I'm in a Mazda Miata. It's a two, it's a two seater convertible. It's tiny. I can whip in and out of spaces. I can go around. But when I'm in the bigger car, it's always a little, you know, because I'm not driving it very often, is uncomfortable. I'm a good driver. I've driven everything in my lifetime. I've never had an accident. I mean. I've driven for, I've driven as a driving instructor. I've driven as a, a private investigator. I've, I've just driven a lot. I've driven in, I don't know how many countries I've driven on the left side of the road, but I'm not fond of big vehicles because I, it, it feels like it takes up so much of the road. And, and since I'm so used to a small vehicle, my turn radius and all that, I'm not comfortable with. So if you were going to put one of these women in the front seat, first of all, yeah, I want to know if it's an automatic or stick, and I haven't figured, I haven't found out any information about that supposed vehicle. Maybe the police have no clue what the vehicle even is, so they don't know. So now you've got one of these three women. If I were putting a woman in the front seat, generally speaking, I didn't know any of these women, I'd pick her. Why? Because she's 40-some years old. She's more level-headed than a bunch of t a couple of teenagers who are completely freaking out. I put her in the front seat and say, I'll kill your daughter if you don't, if you don't, I put her in the front seat, not her. The only way I put her in the front seat is because I trusted her to be able to drive the vehicle. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's, let's go to a very interesting point about the suspects. And I say this, this case is so strange. And it takes you in so many possibilities. And I, I don't have a proper answer for it. So so I don't, so I think the sun is out. Um, I'll get to him in a minute. This here is a tomb, okay? Now, um, S Susie apparently had crappy, crappy boyfriends. <laughs> Let's say she didn't have great choice in men. The guy, a guy named Dustin Reckla, a former boyfriend of Susie Streeter, very, very recently former, broke into a Springfield mausoleum a few months before the women vanished and stole $30 worth of gold fillings from a skull. Police looked at Reckla because Streeter had given investigators a statement about the mausoleum break-in and was rumored to be a probable witness against Reckla in court. Not only that, apparently, according to some, she, she actually drove the getaway car. <laughs> I don't know how accurate that is. Anyway, Reckla and his two friends that helped him in the mausoleum robbery were known to be together and in the area of the night the women went missing. So there were three. All right. Over time, the police have said, the son has been cleared. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, well, the son of the mom has been cleared. The brother of Susie has been cleared. They said these three dudes were cleared. And they said this, this guy is named Robert Cox. Robert Cox is a, he is a, he is a, I, I classify him as a serial killer. He did kidnap a woman. Uh, she was driving. It was not in a house. He drove, he, then he beat her and he, he raped her and beat her and killed her. And she bit his tongue. And so he bit, she almost bit his tongue off, which is how he got caught. And, and he, I think he tried to grab somebody else. So he'd been in prison. He was a piece of work. He was actually in Springfield and actually, which is weird, weird about this whole thing. Is he actually worked at this auto whatever yard with her dad? So you go, whoa, 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 man, that's that's too much of a coincidence. And he and he, he supposedly had an alibi, and it was the uh, mother and father alibi, and the girlfriend alibi, and I went to church in the morning alibi, um, which is not too believe too believable. And later on, they said it was a not a good not a, a, a proven alibi, shall we say? However. He did not know she was going to this house, these house, these their house to, that night. So if he had he had had, a, had the hots for her when he was at the auto place, happened to see her. I don't know that he ever saw her, but if he ever did, he would not know she was there. So she she cannot be the target. And Cox, if you had to pick a person who better than a a little peeping tom dude, 
I would go with Cox as far as he already killed somebody. So he, he's kind of got the thing going. I would put him as a better suspect because if he happened to have a vehicle, which he apparently, apparently did not have the van, um, uh, could they have been taken in another vehicle? I guess they could have been thrown on a back seat and told not to move or I'll shoot you. You know, when you got a guy with a gun, even if he's, you know, even if he's like put one of them in the front seat and pulled a gun on him, you could, you could drive away in a, <laughs> all kinds of other cars, not, a, not necessarily a van. Um, he also sort of make, he could have stolen one. So could have Reckla, the, the, the other guy here, he could have stolen a vehicle. One of these three guys could have had access to somebody's vehicle. I don't know what the police did to, to, prove what vehicle the girls could have even been in or where, whatever. Uh, but they never were found. Um, there was a really stupid thing about Cox that there's a place, there's a Cox hospital there and it has no relation to him at all. And some woman with a, I think it was a psychic dog decided that the three women were buried in, in the garage there because they were building at the time. It's a bunch of nonsense. So no, where do I think the women are? I think the women are a good distance away. I think that one of the problems you have with any crime is if somebody gets somebody into a vehicle and can drive away from the area, they can have a relative with a cabin in the middle of freaking nowhere. They can have somebody, some, some farmland somewhere. They can bury them anywhere if there's access to bury them someplace, and especially if it's out of state. I mean, where are you going to look? So you, know, you look around the area and you look and you look and you look, and if they're buried someplace, the chances of them being found are very limited. Um, and since in 20 years they haven't been found, I'm, I'm assuming they weren't thrown in a ditch on the side of the road. So they had to be buried someplace. But it's, you know, with enough property, you can bury them any place and they will not be discovered. Um, so the problem comes down to this. What was the point of the crime? It's a... It's not a usual crime for a serial killer to kidnap three people out of that house. It's not usual. Could it have been somebody like him? It's possible. But I still believe the target was Susie because of the timing. And so if Susie was a target, then we have to look at who would target her. Uh, now, the police have said Reckla and his two buddies have been cleared. I don't know what they were cleared by. That Somebody could say, oh, it took a, took a I don't know, a polygraph. I, I don't have any proof of anything, or they just thought this is these guys are too dumb to do a crime like this. <laughs> um, I don't think they had good alibis, so I don't think that's it. I don't know why they were cleared. Um, but the three of them, it appears to me, uh, once they opened that door, and rec at some point they recognized who it was. Uh, I think that, that that's the reason the light was twisted. I think that somebody did not want them to immediately recognize him and not open the door. Like, hey, I open the door. You know, I know who you are. I'm not opening the door. Now. I'm going to call the police. I think they didn't want to be seen because they were somebody they knew. And if they opened the door because they couldn't figure out what's going on, then it was too late. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, it, it's possible that they were told some dumb story like, hey, look, we just want to talk. We're going to go for a ride. Leave your purses there. You, know, you don't need your purses. or your, We're not going to be gone that long. You don't need your damn cigarettes. Here, put your purses down there. Just get in the car. We're just going to go for a ride. Talk this over. And then never came back. That would be a more likely scenario to me than some peeping Tom deciding to go after a, a location with three cars. Uh no, I find that hard to believe. Um, and, and and one thing Ken Mains points out is he goes, you know, people think you can't control, one person can't control three people. I agree with him on that entirely. One person can indeed control three people. However, it's easier with two. It is. One person's driving. The other one hurts the three in the back of the van and you leave. It's much easier. And the van is waiting. It's ready to go. You don't have to stop and open the car door and you know all that kind of crap while you're trying to control three people. It's a lot more work, I think, two people. I personally, I would lean toward Reckla and his buddies. I can't come up with any other good reason why the um, crime went down at that time of night only after Susie got there. I think 
Stacy was collateral damage. Um, could it have been Cox? Well, he's just a big talker. Uh, it's pointed out that he said, I know the women are dead. I'm like, no. And so as the says, well, he says he knows, not that he thinks. Well, I know they're dead too. I think everybody knows they're dead. <laughs> well, why would you say that? I mean, especially he's like, you know, he's one of these people who likes to probably play the police and claim things. He goes, oh, I'm going to, I'll confess to the crime after my mother's dead. I'll tell you what really happened. Is it true? Now, Reckla and his buddy both said, I hope, I hope they're dead. I hope, you know, they, they said nasty things about the women. I hope the bitches are dead. Okay. Well, they said that. Should we believe them? Okay. I don't know. I mean, I lean away from Bart. I don't think he did it. So I, I would sit here and say, all right, I'm going to lean more toward Reckla and his buddies because you got more than one. you got at least two, if not three people. You have a motive, which she's about to testify. Uh, Susie, I believe, is the target if, above the other two, which, again, would put Reckla in it. Um, but let's assume these guys are too dumb and stupid to be. And some people say, well, they are too stupid. They're like 19, 20, 21. They're idiots. And they got caught doing the mausoleum thing. They were morons. But this was not a brilliant crime, folks. This is basically somebody shows up in the middle of the night and and that's how the light i don't they knocked on the door smashed something and the doors opened up they pointed a gun said we're going to go for a ride and that's it and they happen to have a place they can get rid of them that's not a brilliant crime could it have been cox i don't know did he know where they lived i mean there has to be a link that he knows where where or, or levitt and streeter live because it, again it's it, mccall wasn't even supposed to be there so he would have to know where they live or just happen upon their place um Happened to pick that particular time and do everything by himself and in a, in a method which he hasn't used before? Is it possible? Yeah, I agree with Ken Mains. I can't take him off the plate entirely, but I'm not going to go with a stupid window peeper. I mean, <laughs> the, the peeping Tom, which we don't even know exists, I, to jump from there to this kind of, this kind of, this kind of, um, not elaborate, but a bigger, such a bigger crime and, and having to kidnap the women, I don't go for it. I'm going to stick with, if I, if I were looking at this crime, I'd be looking very heavily at Reckla and his buddies. Now, supposedly Reckla is married and is, everything's fine. And he's a wonderful human being now. I don't know. I'm not saying Reckla did it. I'm just saying there's more, the crime scene points more to that kind of thing than this kind of thing. Although this is a possibility. But it's... I. I have to look at all, like I said, that's why I asked you in the beginning of this, how many of you know of, of a serial killer who literally kidnapped three women out of a house as opposed to one or attacking them in the house? How many crimes do we have like that? It's extremely rare if it's true. Extremely, extremely rare. Um, not impossible, but extremely rare. So, uh, yeah. So so to me, the timing that they know they... The person did not just go after her, but waited till later hours in the morning. The broken glass, but the person twisted it, did not be seen. At least that's the way it appears. Uh, I personally think two people are more likely to be involved than one because it's a whole lot easier to kidnap two women with uh, three women with two people involved. So one can drive and one can hold them in the back. Yeah, I don't know if I believe the sighting that supposedly she was driving a vehicle and somebody was telling her what to do. I don't know that I believe that. If it's true, it's pretty weird. But if it is true, again, I, I find that hard that a serial killer, <laughs> not knowing these three, would pick this one as opposed to the mom to drive the vehicle. Unless the one who was holding the gun on the ones in the back said, I know you can do this because you've done it before. I know how you drive then it would be somebody she knows. I can't believe somebody she didn't know, if that was her, would have her drive and not her mom. So that to me is more rational. Um, that they were never found, I believe they were taken at quite a distance. I think they were taken far away and I believe they were buried someplace, probably in somebody's relative's land. Uh, it could be a big, huge piece of land. It could be in the woods someplace, but I believe they're buried. Also helps to have two people with, with good shovels. Uh, it's a lot of work. 
Um, but I don't believe they were just dumped on the side of the road or they would have been found. Um, it could be on, it could be under some cement someplace. Somebody could have buried them and then made a nice patio. But I believe it's far or enough away that the police had nowhere to, nowhere to know to look. Um, there's been a bunch of um, supposed, you know, that could be this vehicle, could be that vehicle, but I don't think they know what vehicle it is. And um, I don't know. I don't know what they have to eliminate her ex-boyfriend who she was going to testify against. I don't know who they, what they have to eliminate him. And if I knew, I might say, well, then definitely it's not that dude. But I still think she's the main target and I don't, has to be some reason for it. Um, so those are my thoughts. And let me, let me go see what you all have to say. I've been away for a long time now. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to go now. I'm rolling back through everywhere uh, way back when. Um, it is possible. Okay. The Stainer Yosemite case shows that one person is definitely capable of controlling and abducting three people with one being an adult. Yes. It's just easier with two. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying under certain circumstances, it's easier to have two. That's all. Um, so I, I, I should look up Stainer for a second because I forgot. I forgotten who, what, what, uh, what, what his whole situation was. Um, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna roll him in here, American serial killer, because he was a serial killer. Um, I just want to see what he did in that particular case. Um, Yosemite, okay. He murdered two women and two teenagers. Oh, the Sun. Oh, is that the Sun case? Oh, yeah, that was a really weird one. Um, there was, okay, the whole thing there was that. Um, they were in a fairly isolated location. Um, but yes, that was, that was a, that's a good choice uh, to pick as far as that. He was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge in, in California, just outside of Yosemite Park. He murdered two women and the two teenagers. Um, so they had the two adults and the two ki the two younger ones. Um, so I'm trying to remember uh, exactly how that worked. Um, I actually looked into this case a while back, and now I've forgotten most of the stuff. Um, he had no criminal history and remained calm during the police interview. Oh, that's always nice. Um, I'm trying I'm trying to say I have to look into that one, but that is a good that is a good that is a good example. Okay, thank you. You came up with a good example of someone who abducted more than one person. Um, so it can happen. Uh, it was also, what I want to point out, it was a fairly isolated location. He was a handyman in the area. And th in this particular case, it wasn't that isolated, although the house was not like, you know, on a street, like with the, all in a row. It had a little bit of, let me show you the picture again. So there's a reason, there is a reason to say, eh, it's a little bit more, more secluded then the other houses on the street, where is my picture of that? Yeah. Um, so you can see here, it's this one here. So there are houses here and there's houses here, but there is a little seclusion here uh, with some trees around it. So you could hide more easily there. So I, I think that's reasonable to say, it's a little more secluded. Um, how the person would have known about it, that's that's the question. Uh, Ken Manning thinks it's a peeping Tom. I just, just can't quite go with that one. Um, Let's see. Um, <laughs> Benny says, Pat, you're too kind. Of, I will keep sending you money if you keep talking nice about me. <laughs> no, Benny. I, I, you know, one of the things I appreciate is um, good logical thinking. And Benny, you have been consistently quite logical. And so I'm always, uh, always impressed by that. Um, let's see. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, let me look at this. Lisa, if you're a serial killer and you expect one woman and you find three, what do you do apart from taking them all? Um, I don't know how he'd expect one and find three. Now, mind you, if, let's, let's, let's do a different if on it. Um, gosh, I just suddenly realized I'm really hungry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My stomach's growling. I'm like, I think I'll have something to drink instead of eating something. Mm. I have dinner planned now. Okay. 
Um, what? Okay. If if a, let, for example, let's say Stacy brought her friend. Let's see how can I work? How, how can this be? Let's say. Okay, let's look at the three women. Um. Um. Okay, let's say that Susie didn't have a car. And somebody came and picked up Susie, and then they picked up Stacy, went to a party, and then Stacey, they said, hey, let's go back to my mom's and sleep. So that person dropped off the two girls with mom. Then you would only have mom's car in the carport and nobody in the driveway. Serial killer goes in thinking he's just going for the one woman. Oh, crap, there's two more girls. Now I got a problem. Generally speaking, they'll kill them right there. First of all, this is if this is isolated enough, it's it's 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, this is a good place to tie up people and rape and kill them right there. Taking them is a lot of work. I, I want to point that out. It's a rare thing. It's a lot of work because you have to have a vehicle. You have to put them in your vehicle. You got to then take them and dispose of them somewhere else. It's a lot of work. You got to control them. It's not the easiest thing. Generally speaking, this is not a popular serial killer method. Jumping out of the bushes and killing you on a, a jogging path, popular. Coming through your window and killing you in your bed, popular. But running your car off the road, maybe abducting one person, popular. Once you get in the house, just kill them. You, uh, rape them and kill them. Don't take them with you. It's a pain in the ass. But, okay, maybe you could say his car was in the driveway and he had to get the car out of the driveway quickly. Okay possible but again there were three cars and <laughs> not one car three cars he had to know there was a horde of people in that house and not even necessarily just three people there could have been five people in the house that's a lot to deal with a lot to deal with so it's it's odd it's an odd choice for a serial killer to make um doesn't mean it couldn't have happened it just means it's an odd choice um uh, Sally says, hi, Sally. The Ketty murders you did was the one I, of the first I saw and has really stuck with me. That was a really strange case. Super strange because, again, we had such a bizarre set of circumstances. I personally think, I believe I know who did that one, um, which I said during the, during the actual show, uh, because that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Depending where the body of that one girl ended up was the key to me. So sometimes in a, in a case, you have a... You have one outstanding clue, which you go, I just keep looking at that one clue. That's the one that bothers me. Um, and, and sometimes it's fairly useful. <laughs> sometimes it's a clue that bothers you, but you can't necessarily, like in this case, I'm bothered by the guy turning the, the, the light off. It wasn't supposedly working, so it wouldn't have turned on anyway, but there a reasoning for that. Now, maybe it's just a guy didn't want to be seen. Okay. The timing bothers me and the fact it took three women and only after Susie arrived home. Those things bother me. There's more than one clue there. There's like three clues together that bother me, which lead me away from a serial killer and towards something else. But, you know, I don't have access to oh, those files, you know. Oh, my God, if I could have seen. I might I might read these files and go, oh, Christ, it's not Reckle and his little friends. It's, it's, there's no way in God's earth. And that's, that's what happens when you look at things from the outside. Um, that's why I call it an educational channel. We're here to an, uh, analyze, not to come to a conclusive, you know, who did it, but to understand how we analyze. And, and hopefully anybody watching this, and I'm hoping all way in the future, um, I'm hoping this, um, all of my videos, I'm hoping, will eventually there will be detectives out there, police officers, other people who are studying profile, who will come across my videos and go, oh, this is teaching me how to think and analyze. Yes, that's the whole point. Not teaching you that Pat Brown's right. I said this happened and this damn well did happen. No, I want to teach people how to think because these crimes are probably not going to get solved. This one, we're going to be lucky if any ever gets solved. But there's, you know, we all know there's a new crime every week. And we, if we, the better people can analyze who have those crimes, the better off those uh, victims' families will be. That some, there will get some justice, you know. Some, some we'll get some creepy dude off the, um, off the road. Um, let's see. Um, 
Marie uh, says, Pat, what, what is your view on this? Should we never listen to serial killers because they might be just manipulating us? Or should we sometimes study them by talking to them to learn how they think? It's a good question. Um, the tricky part here is <laughs> how many times you have to study serial killers to know how they think? You know, do we have to repeat something a thousand times over because like the next one's going to teach us more? Because I personally think I already know how they think. I don't really need to. I don't want to talk to any of them. I don't think they have anything to teach me at this point. I mean, how much are you going to teach me? Secondly, they lie like a dog. I mean, they lie constantly. They're pathological liars and they manipulate. They like to play you. So when somebody goes in to talk to them, how much of truth are they getting? Um They'll lie all over the place. They'll lie about their backgrounds. So they'll lie about how the crime went down. They'll lie about what the victim did to cause the crime. They'll, they'll lie and lie and lie. They're creating fantasies. Now, you have to be very, very smart, very knowledgeable, and very, um, very, very tough and not easy to manipulate when you talk to these people. Now, I only talk to, I have to admit, um, in my, I, I, I never was one to go talk to serial killers. I never wanted to. I've had serial killers write me and I've never, never contacted them back because I already saw the manipulations. But I remember the one time I went to talk to a killer. It was in a, a top security prison. It was, um, I forgot her name now. She killed her stepson. She drowned him in the pool. And I, I did it for a television show. And I, I was in a Florida, I think it was a Florida. It's hard to remember sometimes what you do. And you can do a lot of television. I think it was in Florida. If only time I've been in a high security prison and it's creepy. So, so you know, they I came in, they brought me through, and I'm I'm here now, and this woman is sitting next to me, across from me, and with a pitiful face. And she wanted to tell me that she didn't do that, that she's been imprisoned wrongly. And she was so sad. She was so sad. And she sat across from me, think, and of course I played, I played whatever game she needed to be played. Um and she told me her sad story, and she thought I would believe her. And I knew I was just like I'm sitting there going, "You are such a freaking liar." <laughs> and and it wasn't because I knew she did it, and therefore it was because I could see her playing the game. So you have to have people who understand that and don't fall for things. And we take the recent whole thing about Julia and Fia crap that's been going on with the metal mechanic case same thing it's like i saw this in like instant i'm like julia's lying she's a scammer i knew fia was lying i knew she was a scammer i knew it was going to be two scammers getting together and playing a bigger scam and people are like oh it couldn't be oh. no you, you know if you're if you are if you understand how psychopaths work you understand how they work um but you have to be very grounded shall we say and not easily manipulated. And so I think the problem is, what, what, uh, my issue with Ken Mains with the whole thing was he, we brought the killer into public view and claimed that he, oh, I, we want to listen to him because we want to learn from him. The public does not need to learn from a psychopathic pathological liar. That is wrong for you to present. That's my opinion. You could do, if you want to do that in private, bully for you. I don't care, you know, I don't go for it. But if you want to sit there with this, this, this little liar killer, then you do it. But the guy is still, I looked at his stuff. The, the man, the convict is still lying about the crime. He's not changed. He's still a psychopath and he knew nothing. His whole concept of the whole, the whole uh, Idaho crime was wrong. And why would he know more than a profiler about that crime? So I profiled that crime as an incel mass murder, most likely. Or I said, there's two possibilities. I said, there's two. I said, because of the choice, I said, it's either the the boy, the breakup of the boyfriend, which sometimes when people break up with a boyfriend and they've been ghosting them and you, you know they have a psychopathic personality, they may go and do this kind of thing. This is this is this has happened before. I said, it's either that or an incel mass murder. It turned out to be the incel mass murder. That was based on what I knew at the time. But this serial, this, this, this killer dude comes out and he gives his opinion. Why? He's not a profiler. He's read books that makes him, oh, because he's a psychopath, he understands psychopaths better? No, psychopaths often don't understand psychopaths better because 
they don't have any empathy or understanding of other human beings, including other psychopaths. <laughs> They're so big into manipulation and lies that they don't even get that. So it's nonsense that they getting in, the killer can help you get inside another killer's mind. Don't fall for that nonsense. And I'm so I'm sorry that Ken Mains did. And I'm sorry he brought it to the public. He shouldn't have done it. And I, and I just hope at some point he buries this whole thing and it goes away because I don't think, I don't disagree with a lot of things he does on his channel. I think a lot of this stuff is useful. And he was the one person I promoted early on because I want people to see more channels that I consider closer to mine where you have real detectives and profilers giving valid analysis, even if I don't always agree with them and they don't always agree with me, that we can learn from. That I just think was a huge mistake of his. And I hope one day he just comes forth and says that I shouldn't have done that. I'm back to what I, I should be doing. And I'm good with that then. I don't, I don't believe in canceling people. I just was very upset about that. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Um, um, <laughs> uh, if I miss, yeah, Pat misses you. Okay. Is it worth putting a question in the comments? Yes. Um, I will say this. I do, tr I do sometimes answer comments in, on my YouTube channel. Now, Ken Maines doesn't has never answered a comment as far as I can see, and neither has Dr. Grande, but I'm gonna I'm gonna support them and why they don't. <laughs> okay. They have way more people than I do. Grande's got over a million. Uh Ken, Ken I think, is up to like 80, 84,000. I'm I'm at 25,000. The more people you get, the less comments you see. And at a certain point, you sort of go. I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Now, what I do is I do I do a few times a day, scroll through. The, there's a there's a on the platform, YouTube platform, there's a place you can go to. You can click on recent comments. I, I scroll through the recent comments. And if I see something worthwhile comment, worthwhile responding to, because I think it's intelligent, because it's a good question or it's a good analysis, I will comment on that. I do that a lot. I probably I. I do that more than most of the people I know on, on YouTube. Um, how long I can keep doing it, I don't know. I think I will always do it to some extent because I like I, I like hearing what people have to say and I like I like you know communicating. Um, so I even if I think I had a hundred thousand subscribers or a million subscribers, I try to do some of it anyway. But it get does get lost when you have like all of a sudden there's five thousand comments. I mean, really, <laughs> yeah. I can't blame people who have larger subscribers numbers than I do for not commenting. I do try. I do try, especially if you say something interesting, because um, I don't waste my time with a lot of nonsensey stuff, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, Marie says, I have been wondering about that question about killers, because I do think you could give them attention they shouldn't get. But I also think it could give us some idea how they think. We, ha we should just do this judici ju judiciously, okay? It's just, it's like, it's like true crime channels. Um, do we have too many true crime channels full of grifters and liars and frauds? Yes, <laughs> most of them. And that's sad to me because I mean, I, I that's why I very rarely recommend anything because I'm like, oh, don't go there. <laughs> that person's, you know, uh, lots of gossip, lots of pointing fingers at people that and going after them day after day with these crazy stuff. And in certain cases, they just they say hundreds of videos on one case with just nonsense and horrific stuff. Um, but so we, we we should have I don't want to jump to true crime channels, but we should do it right. Same thing is true with documentaries. We got so much trash documentaries out there. I just want to punch them in the face. Making 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 a murder was nonsense. Absolute, not even nonsense. It was despicable. A despicable, manic, manipulative, money making piece of garbage run by the defense. Stephen Avery is guilty as hell. As, I can't even think of a person I think more guilty than Stephen Avery. The evidence was overwhelming, and yet they did that. But does that mean Netflix has never made a good documentary? No, I've liked some of their Netflix documentaries very well. I just wish we had just the good ones and all, all the crappy ones. So I would say we're running about 80% garbage, 90% garbage and 10%, 20% decent. So should we ever listen to what they have to say? Under certain circumstances, yes, it can be informative, but we have to be very, very careful how we do it, who's doing it, how we're presenting it. So yeah. Um, uh that's probably true uh lisa n says uh 
Forensic psychologists can do that work without publicity. I think it's a publicity Pat objects to. Um, yes, and also that theoretically, if I interview, let's say somebody says, okay, Pat Brown, I want you to interview a whole bunch of killers. Uh, I want you to write a book. Uh, I want you to write a book on 10 serial killers. I want you to really get into their heads and, and see what you, truth you can get out. Now, if I do this properly, and, and I, it, part of it just makes me throw up because I serial killers just love an author coming to, a profiler coming to their prison where they can, now can get off on telling this crap to the profile. They love profiles, by the way. Serial killers love profiles because you get me, right? You get me. You know what I'm about. And I'm going to tell you how I killed that girl and how I raped her. Mm -mm. And I, and I, I want to watch your face. I want to see if you're upset by it or you can. Maybe you get off on it. You know, they, they like to do this stuff. So you have to get somebody in there, first of all, who can handle all of this calmly. But then again, how much am I just giving him a cheap ass thrill as opposed to, uh, for me to write a book? Am I making, is that the reason I'm going to give 10 serial killers f all this fun of having a profiler come and talk to them just so I can make money off a book? And is, is my book worthy of that? So, I mean, I'm... I'm 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 on a, on the fence about that because I mean it's like ethically I have to decide whether what I'm doing is just for my own personal you know career or banking account as a po and and allowing this guy to get this thrill or am I doing any good? You have to ask first: Are you doing any good for somebody? Like a true crime channel, in my opinion, am I doing good? I hope that I'm teaching. If I'm not teaching, I don't want to be here because it's just it's, it's, you know, I can make money some other way. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do something that's creepy, you know. <laughs> um, did the bulb still work? It wasn't smashed with the globe. Supposedly the bulb was, there was an electric thing. I don't know if it's the bulb. I think it was the, the electric thing wasn't properly working. So if the bulb was not on, which it wouldn't have been under those circumstances, the person twisted it because they thought they would turn it off so that therefore when the light switch was put on it wouldn't turn on because it wouldn't be working that's the theory on that but it was not smashed with a globe it was still there but supposedly it wasn't working anyway now who would now obviously the person would not have known that i don't even care who they were they wouldn't have known that um so going like this made sense at turning the bulb off so it wouldn't turn on but the those are just theories because i can't get to the absolute information on that which is so frustrating but that's what i was led to believe in 2000 by people who supposedly knew that the bulb was the whole light fixture wasn't functional um let's see um uh um no i do not believe it's staged sally uh at all i mean not something the girls would have done themselves with the purses i i do, there's no staging here. There's, it serves no purpose. And when, when we look at staging, staging has to serve a real purpose, it has to make you think something happened. What, what would putting purses in a row at that location pr tell us anything? Because I still don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> so, so that's not staging. Staging would be somebody look, made it look like a burglary. Um, somebody made it look like they left on their own. If you want to stage that, you take the purses with you and the cigarettes. You take their shoes, you make sure, get dressed, ladies, get your clothes on. I'm going to get in the vehicle. We're going to take our purses, go make it look like you left on purpose. That would be staging. The fact that the three purses are there is very confusing as far as it doesn't really make sense, but it's not a staging thing at all. It is more like, I don't know, somebody looked through the crap, they grab, get the purse. Maybe they told the second person, get all their purses. They looked in them and dumped them. I don't know. Don't know but it's not staging. Um, let's see. Uh, so I just answered that one. Let's see. Um, uh, peep, yeah, Peeping Tom is, is very much a beginning part of uh, serial rapists and serial killers. I'm not objecting to the fact that a serial, uh, Peeping Tom becomes that. As a matter of fact, all Peeping Toms should be taken seriously. And some of them, I mean, they'll like have peeped in like 30 windows and the police go, eh, he's just a peeper. No, he's not just a peeper. He's a serial peeper. 
<laughs> a serial people is a serial predator. A serial predator becomes a serial rapist, and sometimes serial rapists become serial killers. Serial predator is a serial predator. I don't care what the hell he does. But we just don't know that a that it was a serial pe uh, that it was a peeping tom, and two, we don't know if he reached that next stage yet. To go from just peeping to kidnapping and killing three women is huge, big jump. That that that's why I say. It's too big a jump to take at this point because we don't have any evidence that he was any more than, first of all, we don't even know he's a serial peeper. <laughs> you know, if it's just one guy looking at a window, it doesn't mean it's it's, it's that guy. Um, yeah, they all, they started that way, but they didn't, they started, they usually did that for quite a while before they moved to the next level. Going from, I say, serial peeping to let me get my van, get in my van and kidnap three women is a big difference. Big, big difference. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, sure. um, Stephanie says, I, I'm not sure I'd choose a house with so many cars parked out in front. Who knows how many people could be in that house with three cars? That's a lot. I mean, there's two cars out front and one in the carport. But yes, um, unless somebody was very aware of who lived there, uh, if somebody knew the girls and knew that uh, Susie lived there with her mom and the ship, generally speaking, would be two, they might not have known the mom's car was in the carport. They might have believed mom's car and Susie's car were the two. You see? That I can see. Uh, maybe they came, um, they were looking for Susie and they knew, maybe they knew Susie's car, for example, but didn't know mom's car. Maybe they drove by and no, they didn't see Susie's car, the red car, because mom's car was bl blue and was in the carport. Maybe they didn't see the red car, so they just kept going. Maybe they came back, and later on they saw the red car, and they saw the other red car. Maybe they didn't know mom's car was in the carport. Maybe they couldn't see the blue car, and they saw the two red ones. Said, oh, mom and Susie are home now. Let's go get them. And, oh, extra kid. Um, don't know, but, um, yeah. But if they, if you're just going, if you're just a complete stranger and you're going to pick a house, house of three, three, three cars and a dog, it's a little, little mutt, but still. Three cars and a dog is much harder than one woman and a cat. <laughs> you know, it is. And, and again, generally speaking, serial killers go for what's easy. They do, just generally speaking. Um, um, this is a good question, and this is reasonable. Why wouldn't you have chosen a different time when Susie was home alone? I'm sure she stayed home alone at some point. Okay, let's assume it's reckless. Okay. And I don't know that it is. Again, I no. This man is you know, now married, has kids, maybe the greatest guy in the world. Um, he is two weeks to uh, to a hearing. Could he have followed her and kidnapped her off the street? Sure. Could he have found a time when mom was at the hairdresser doing her, her job and she was home alone? Yes. So would that make sense that he would within those two weeks, he only got two weeks to work with that. This would be more reasonable. Yes, I agree. Uh, that's perfectly, that's a very logical question. So the answer to that is, yeah, you would think so. Um, maybe the opportunity never arrived for whatever reasons. I don't know. Um, maybe that was the day you get pissed. Maybe he got together with his friends and were, they were roaming about and said, hey, let's do this. So the, the problem comes down to what's most rational and what sometimes happens. Same thing with same things with sometimes serial killers. You think, why would they do that when this was easier? So sometimes, again, could a serial killer have come in and decided to kidnap three, three women? Yeah, possibly. I'd go with Cox if I were going to go with anybody on that one who is local to the area. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes you have to look in two different directions. I, I, I just, uh, but I think the timing and the timing is interesting to me because I just think if you're really, if you're really watching that house, just go for the one. I mean, just true. The woman was older, but she still was thin, small. Do you really want to have to deal with all the rest of it? I don't know. Maybe there's one out there that really wants to do that. And maybe the, you know, it's say, this is why this case is, 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 this is where if I work in the case, you get the frustration point 
And then hopefully you get access to all the different interviews and all the little details. And you start seeing that some things make more sense than other things. Don't have that access, which is frustrating. Um, um, <laughs> I agree with Pat's reason why it wasn't a random stranger. At least I think that's where she's going. It seems to me it's not random. It seems an odd choice for a random stranger. But, yeah, but we don't know. Um, let's see. Um, um, here's a quick question Sky Ricky says about Kohlberger, uh, which is the Idaho, uh, 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 the Idaho suspect who is in custody. Kohlberger managed to supposedly kill four people. What? Okay, I don't understand that whole question. <laughs> but Kohlberger did manage to kill four people, but they killed them on the property and didn't take them with them. Um, yeah, that that would be that would be that would be Susie. Uh, Reckler had issues at the time. He was a whack job, you know what I mean? He'd, he he committed crimes, and he was yeah. That would be that would be Susie. Um, uh, Stephanie says interesting because the turn bulb is a stealthy move, but breaking the globe is potentially att att attention attracting. Yes, when and how? Again, there's two possibilities. One is the globe was purposely smashed for the noise factor. The second one is the person went up to do the turning of that and the stupid globe was not, you know, you got the, look at, yeah, my life with that. <laughs> okay, I've had this problem before. You got like three uh, screws, but they had a problem with the, with the, with the electrical, apparently. So did somebody not put the screws back in properly so that when the person reached up to turn the thing, the damn thing just fell? Is that what happened? And we weren't there, so we don't know. I wish there were video cameras. We don't. They didn't have them back then, or cell phones. So you know, there. You know, we don't know these things, but that can happen. Um, and depending on it's a new house, somebody just moved in. They're fixing things. Did they? You know, did they get careless in fixing things? Was it like, oh God, they'll have to fix that later? I mean, there are people, um, like like handyman type, who. I have a brother-in-law. If my sister my sister's watching this, she'll know what I'm talking about. So my brother-in-law, very, very careful man. When he goes and fixes something, he makes sure that sucker is fixed. And he's very particular about everything being done exactly right. But not everybody's like that. Some people are careless. Sometimes, especially if you're not a handy person, you're just like, oh, shit, I got to put this thing up. Oh, oh crap. And somebody called, oh, father, the phone's ringing. <laughs> and he run off. And uh, the things are there, but it's not there, there, you know, that's what, that, that can happen. And so we don't know why it fell or why it was broken. Um, hey, <laughs> my first car was a stick. Hey, useful to know. I still drive a stick. I've driven a stick the last 30 years, I think now. I can't, now that I have a, a sports car, I, you know, I'm like, I cannot, when I bought the sports car, somebody said, do you want the automatic? I'm like, that's just so wrong. You can't drive a sports car and have it be automatic. You can't do that. So no. Yeah. So I gotta do that. But it's 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 done me well knowing how to drive a stick. I've driven a stick in so many countries where when you get to the rental place, they just don't have an automatic. And I was with a friend once and and she had rented the car and she gets there and she's like, I want an automatic. And they're like, We don't have one. She's like, Ah, what do we do? And I'm like, I can drive a stick. <laughs> So I drove the whole trip. <laughs> Very useful. <laughs> Took you forever to learn. It, 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 sticks are tricky. They are. They're tricky. But once you got it, you got it. You know, once you got it. <laughs> Marie says, driving a stick in Denmark is just driving a car. <laughs> true. Yeah, that is absolutely true. <laughs> so you know a lot of places that is just what you drive so it's not a big deal but in the u.s it's it's gone out of fashion so very few people can drive a stick here anymore yeah in all of europe most people drive a stick uh, yeah uh, u.s has totally gone they're even very automatic even with sports cars now it's sad but that's that's where we're at um <laughs> but I, I do love a stick so i'm one of those guys um let's say um uh, stealing gold from corpses is as low as it gets. Yeah, okay, let me explain something about this. They were supposedly kind of like claim as they're like kind of a Satanisty thing too, you know, they were kind of in satanic crap, just kind of into really 
like bad behavior, shall we say. Yeah, breaking into mausoleums and stealing the gold out of somebody's skull. And I think there was actually a picture. I forgot to put the picture up. It was like a t they put the skull in a tree or something too. It's like, and then they went to a, a secondhand shop and tried to sell the gold and it got like 30 bucks. So, but you know, so, I mean, it's pitiful, but it also says something about the personalities. Now, some people will say hey, they were just kids you know, that there were just bad teens at that time and they turned out okay in the long run. And maybe that's true, but um, I don't know. In my opinion, that's pretty bad behavior. I, I just think that's, you know, who does that <laughs> is always my question. But, you know, yeah, grave robber in this kind of, kind of, and who knows, maybe they found three graves for the three women and, you know, replaced the bodies there. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but... <laughs> My dog is psychic too. He always knows where the food is. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, Candini says, uh, it had to be someone with a weapon on one that made the other two obey. Well, this is the whole point. Once you point a gun at one person or a, put a knife around somebody's throat, this is the same thing with the Delphi murders. So, uh, people went crazy about, it. I don't know how one person could control these two teenage girls. And I'm thinking, this is simple as all crap, you know. You you put the knife on one girl's throat and you say to the other one, lay down or I'll kill your friend. That's it. Then you kill her, your friend and then you go over and kill the other girl. You know, it's not that hard. Um, uh, so even with three, as long as you've got one of them under your control and you tell the other ones you're going to kill that one. And so if I were going to choose, make a choice there, um, I would pick the ones that are related first um, because a mother will protect her daughter and a daughter will not want her mother killed. So I'd go for one of them before I'd go for putting the knife on uh, Stacy. But then again, that depends whether the person kill, abducting them knew who they were dealing with. Um, so, um, oh, would the kidnapper know that Susie wasn't supposed to be home that night? If he was stalking or knew her. Yeah, actually, your point, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. She wasn't supposed to be there either. Um, but so she was supposed to go and st she was supposed to stay elsewhere. And then they were going to go, you know, to the, the, the water park and all that the next day. Uh, there was some original plan about staying in a hotel. And then they were going to stay at a friend's house. And then they ended up there. I, in reality, neither one of them should have been there, um, including, you know, Susie shouldn't have been either. It should have just been Cheryl Levitt, the mom. But um, some people do, okay, here's another theory some people have, that Cheryl, the guy went in and was already like holding a knife to Cheryl Levitt when the girls arrived home. But that can't be true because the girls came home, took off their makeup, took off their clothes and got into bed. So that whole scenario doesn't work. So whoever went there, went there after there were three cars in the driveway. Now, mind you, um, just because somebody goes and looks for somebody one night and doesn't find them doesn't mean they're not going to come back the next night. So was Susie supposed to be home? Maybe, maybe they came earlier and thought, oh, crap, Susie not here. Well, let's come back later and see if she shows up after she's out drinking. Away. They may not know she wasn't even supposed to be there, but they come back and lo and behold, her car's there. They're good. Or it was just random that somebody just popped up at three, four or five in the morning and decided to go into this house, which to me just, mm, yeah. Oh, uh, one of the girls was in their underwear. Uh, she, they were in bed. So, I mean, if somebody is going to tell you, you know, we're going to go for a ride now, get in the vehicle. It doesn't matter if you're in underwear, I have no shoes. You're going to get, you're going to do what they tell you to do. I mean, you're not going to say, excuse me, can I go put my pants on first? I say, hell no. <laughs> I told you to get in the damn vehicle. You don't need to be wearing any damn pants. You're going to be inside the vehicle. We're not getting out. We're going for a ride. Whatever lie they told them, you know. And maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe they were just going for a ride and it went bad. We don't know that either. So we don't know what the motive is. If it was a serial killer, well, then the motive was to abduct the women, take them someplace, rape them and murder them. That would be the motive. If it's not a serial killer, then why were they taken? Were they taken to scare them? Were they taken to eliminate them? 
were they, who knows? And this is the problem. We got the serial killer over here, which is an obvious motive. We got something over here, which we just not quite sure. But again, if it was targeted, then this is the answer, but we just don't know exactly what the motive was. Um, <laughs> I would not leave my cigarettes no matter. Haha, <laughs> no longer a smoker. Well, if, it, if the person puts a gun on your head and says you're leaving a damn cigarettes, they will. You know, so yeah, obviously they didn't take them. That's the point. They did not go no matter what. Um, um, so motive would, uh, Lauren says, would the motive then be to kill Susie before the court hearing? A lot of people would say, this is pretty stupid. It wasn't a, you know, in other words, he, it wasn't like Reckler and his two buddies were going to go away for 30 years. It was a, it was a stupid crime. Um, I don't even know how much time they would have gotten, but they may have been pissed because they did say they hope the bitches are dead. So, yeah, you know, so there was a hatred toward them towards Susie for whatever reasons. It was kind of weird that they'd include Stacy in that and the mom in that. What the heck? You know, why would you have that nasty attitude? So it's possible that although they're, that although the fact that Susie ratted them out, which she did, isn't, you no, know, the, the time they would have spent in prison would have been very limited. It might have even just gotten probation. I don't know, back then they were a little bit tougher back then today. They just, you know, go. <laughs> it's a it's just a great Um, But they may have been pissed at her and decided to teach her a lesson. I don't know what the lesson would have been. Again, we, it's very hard. When, when you talk about getting inside the heads of killers, if you, if you asked a, a person about this crime, you could ask 10 different killers and you would get 10 different stories. One would say they were just going to take them for a drive and say, hey, Look, I already got your mom here and Stacy. I got all you ladies in the car. Don't you read us that? You just don't show up in court. You don't say anything about us. You say you will. You take back what you said. Maybe that was the plan. Or the next one will say they just want to beat the hell out of her. The next one will say, well, they decided they hated hated her anyway. She wasn't going to show up in court. They were just going to kill them all. The other one will say, hey, they already had three ladies. Might as well rape and kill them and have all, all that happen. Who knows? Because we're not psychopaths. <laughs> And anybody who thinks even a profile that can get inside the mind of a killer is full of it. You know, just absolute full of it. So um, <laughs> I'm going to be unpopular in this one, but I really don't like polygraphs as evidence of anyone, anything. Polygraphs, I'm, uh, polygraphs are tricky little beasts. And yeah, the problem with a polygraph is it's never actually been it's the usefulness of it is actually to be able to watch the person as they give their, their statement throughout. So it's a, it's a, it's investigative tool more than it is an accurate tool. Um, have I, there, there are ways to make it more accurate than others. And I point this out many times. I've, I've worked on some cases where I said, okay, I brought in and I brought in a polygraph person, a polygrapher. And I said, you're supposed to ask four questions. These are the four questions. After you get this, the, you know, the question you're supposed to ask to beginning to, to make sure you know what, what he's, how he responds to things. Then you ask the four important questions. And here is the trick. Every one of those questions has to be absolute yes or absolute no with nothing questionable in between. So, um, so you can't ask somebody a question that's wishy-washy. Do you feel guilty over the death of your wife? Well, I didn't kill her, but I feel guilty because maybe if I come home an hour earlier, she wouldn't be dead. That's a wishy-washy question. Did you kill your wife is more appropriate because <laughs> you can't. It's a yes or a no. So you have to ask the questions and usually just for that absolute yes or no questions that related to the exact circumstances um, and nothing, nothing questionable about it. Like uh, if I were questioning Rekla here, I would say, did you abduct the three women from the house? Yes or no. Did you, did you or your accomplices kill the women? Yes or no? 
that kind of thing. So yeah, that's something very, very clear. Uh, do I trust them entirely? No, because psychopaths can sometimes pass those tests and sometimes people aren't psychopaths screw up those tests. So there you go. That's why they're never allowed in court. Um, my people say you shouldn't take them <laughs> um, for good reason. Um, there were no cameras that we know of back then. So yeah, that didn't happen. Um, uh, yeah, the, the he was prosecuted. I forgot. Um, what did what did Reckler get for that? I, I did have something pulled up here. Um, uh, what what he was? Uh, let's see what he got. Um, Reckler spring. I, I had it in front of me, but I've lost where I put it. Um, uh, sentencing. I'll put in that and see if I come up with it. Okay, Reckler was accused of breaking into the. Um, okay, here we go. Let's see if this is here. Um, okay. He was charged. Okay, wait a minute. He was accused and he was charged of felony institutional vandalism along with Michael Clay and Joseph Rydell. She gave a statement. Okay, well, it doesn't tell what happened to him. Ah, crap. Um, I thought I saw it somewhere. Oh, reckless sentence there. Maybe this is it. Um, uh, okay. Did they? Okay. See what I said? Oh my God, it's always true. Uh, a, spring, a Springfield man who admitted involvement with two other men in cemetery vandalism received a suspended sentence Friday, but faces strict probation conditions. Dustin Reckler remained outside while two other men, he was outside, there's a lot, I guess he was watching, entered a mausoleum. The three were accused of stealing $30 worth of gold fillings from the teeth of a corpse. They did really, $30, dang, that must have been cheap gold. <laughs> Very teeny. Um, uh, uh, the judge gave Reckler a suspended three-year state prison term and placed him in a community sentencing program, an intensive form of probation. Reckler must also spend 14 days in a county jail as shock probation. Oh my God, two weeks in a county jail. It's gonna... <laughs> really? <laughs> and provide 150 hours of community service and make restitution for the damage. So let's see... Uh... What did the other ones get? Rydell, uh, who moved to Illinois, left his address without notifying his probation officer. He, he received a suspended three-year sentence. And where's Michael Clay? Oh, it's still pending at this point. So I say they really got slaps on the wrist for this. Um, but that doesn't mean they couldn't suffer from some other anger issues, uh, for, you know, being pissed off, at make you pay type of thing. But that's why a lot of people think they didn't do it because A, they're idiots, and B, uh, they didn't they weren't up for a big sentence. And um, they, they and the police said at some point they were clear, but a lot of people think they were clear because one police, whoever was in charge, said, I don't think they did it. That kind of clear. Clear, there's only one way to clear people. I want people to always understand this. They couldn't have accomplished the crime. One they were, their alibi was so solid. They were out of the country. They were in prison at the time. They were in the ICU. They were dead. <laughs> they were, in whatever. There's have to be something like that. That's the only way you can actually clear somebody. Everything else, you can think they didn't do it, but it doesn't clear them. And it really bugs me when somebody said they're cleared when they're not cleared. They can, you can say, for myself, they're no longer a top suspect or they're no longer a suspect or they're not a good suspect. You can say all those things. No longer person of interest to us. But that's not the same thing as cleared. Cleared means I don't care if you pass a polygraph. That doesn't clear you. Cleared means there's no way in God's earth you could have committed the crime. And other than that, it's possible. So... Um, Uh, no, they, they, it couldn't have been because the girls wouldn't, I mean, you, you're, you're, here's a thought that you're, ah, this is okay. Um, I, li I like when, you know, you come up with a different concept here. Um, okay. So could it be that somebody who knew the mom came in and mom and he were hanging out, smoking some cigarettes and having a drink, maybe having some sex or whatever, you know, um, he was helping her paint. Who knows? You know, and the girls come home and they go, hi mom. Hi, whoever. And then the girls get ready for bed. They get in bed. And then the dude 
suddenly decides, I'm going to kidnap all three of you. Possible? Yes, probable, very, very, not, not real probable, but absolutely, but possible. And again, we have to look at possible. Uh, the son, for example, those who think he did it, well, possible. He could have been that guy who was over there saying, mom, will you finally forgive me? You know, I'm trying to make up to you. You know, I know you don't like me anymore. But can, and, then, and the sis comes home and says, oh, hey, brother, you hear what? Trying to convince mom to let you back into her life? Uh-huh. Oh, well, we're going to bed. And then he gets mad at mom in the middle of the night and decides to kidnap them all. And, you know, the thing about analyzing things is you can make up a whole lot of scenarios, a whole lot of them. I mean, crazy scenarios. And I mean, and they're, they're not necessarily plausible, but possible, not probable, but possible. You can come up with a whole bunch of them. But if you're going to investigate a crime, you can't go with every single scenario that ever exists out there. You have to go with the most probable of the bunch. Um, and usually, the, if you have enough clues, enough evidence, you can go in a proper direction. The problem with this case is it's very limited. Now, mind you, I don't know. It's possible that whoever was investigating this case in the beginning screwed up. I mean, there may have been limited evidence, but maybe when they brought in their suspects, they completely botched the invest their, their interrogations. Maybe they didn't. I mean, they've done. I mean, there's boxes and boxes and boxes of, I mean, over the years, I mean, huge amounts of people. They, they had so many ridiculous tips come in that they wasted their time with. And, you know, and, and oh, oh, God knows how many vehicles they went and looked for. The question is, is did they just miss something? And, if you miss one thing, that can be all you need to miss. And um, then you can't figure it out. But I wasn't there. So, um, you know, I came in in 2000 and wasn't, I didn't get to access the police files, which really sucks. Um, what's this? Um, what, 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 what? Wait a minute. I've got you on playback. I don't want to ruin watching the case as in hearing the discussion without a clue. Oh, <laughs> okay. You can, you can do that. <laughs> um, um, I would think it'd be risky to transport three people if you're just one abductor. Not impossible. I think two abductors would be better. Yes. It's a whole lot easier with two people, especially, you know, especially if you do have a van. You know, see, you get the one guy up front and the one holding the three in the back and you're in much better shape. Nobody sees what's going on back there. The guy can drive in relative peace up front. That they see just a guy behind the wheel. That's not a big deal. Um, now, at some point, the women, now, mind you, they could have had ropes in there. Um, people could have been tied up. We don't know. So let's say the, the women were taken into the van and then they were tied up. Well, then you don't have to worry about it anymore anyway. That's possible. But yes, it's easier with two than one. One can do it, so you can't take that away. But two is easier. You're correct. Um um, if someone wanted Susie and I would, and also think so, why would he choose graduation party day? He would have known she wouldn't be alone or home very late. Again, um, it's, it's not the greatest day. You're correct. Um, was he watching the house three, three or four days over? Was it just that they were out? See, this is what, this is where things get so messed up. Think about your own life. Um, because and a lot of times I like to talk about my own life, uh, not because it's because I got to talk about myself, but because I have situations where things happen. And I remember a day I went. <laughs> my, I normally lived alone, and my son had returned from India, and he was living with me for a little while. I mean, and he would go out, you know, with his friends, and I wouldn't pay any attention when he came back. However, I would say this. I was more aware, you know, he could, if he lived someplace else and was out all night long, I was like, oh, I didn't know. But, you know, when you live there and then you're expecting the person to come back and, you know, you're listening for the sound of the car coming down the gravel driveway. And it's like, he comes in at three o'clock in the morning. You're like, oh, okay, he's home. You know, you do that. Well, of course, I'm thinking of that. I'm his mom. So all that. So one day, I don't know, I went shopping at Giant. Okay. And I, I think I went late. I think it was closed. I don't know if close to midnight or I don't know if it's all nighter. I don't know. I went shopping late and I ran into this guy. I didn't know the guy. I'll admit it. I didn't know the guy. We got in a conversation and we ended up, because you know I am a talker. So <laughs> you can profile me right now. So I don't know. He must have been interesting. I don't know what our topic was, but we ended up standing outside Giant. I, I'm assuming I wasn't scared of him. I, maybe the place was still open. 
but we were chatting. And then my son freaked out because he's like, my mom just went to the damn grocery store. She should be back by now. And I didn't come back for like two and a half hours or three hours. I don't know what it was. I came, he was like freaking out. And I'm like, he's like, where were you? I'm like, talking to some guy outside the grocery store. Now, did this happen often? No. I mean, I cannot remember another occasion when I stood outside a grocery store and near midnight talking to some guy. And I, we didn't, we went our separate ways. It didn't turn into a date. I don't know why we were talking. Maybe I was lonely that night or bored or maybe it just was, we had something in common. We just, it happened that time. So let's say you've got Reckler and his dudes, they're out, they're driving around. School's over. Hey, all the good, all the graduation went on today. They're drinking. They're like, hey, let's go by. Let's go see if she's home. And they do. And she is. That's all it takes. It could be that simple. Um, it's hard to say. Could there be a, is it more reasonable something else happened, you know, in some other way or should happen in some other way? Sure. Um, same thing with serial killers even, you know, it could be for whatever reason. Some serial killer did come through the neighborhood and just happen upon the house. I just find it hard because of the timing and the cars and that, that's, I, you know, I, I just find that unlikely. So um, the purses in the room thing is always unsettling. Yeah, and it's weird. And we don't know why. We don't know why. Um. Um, that's a good point. Katie says, I feel like they had to also know there was no man in the home. You would think if, you know, because a little bit isolated place um, had some um, out uh, kind of, um, a, you know, fenced in area. You wouldn't know if there's a guy with a, with a weapon in there or a female with a weapon. But still, you know, let's face it, guys are usually worried more about guys than females. You know, so the last thing you want to do is have a dude come to the door with a shotgun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would rather not write that book. <laughs> I do know methodologies, but I, do, I do, definitely don't want them. To, yeah, this is a good point. Antini says each of them are tiny, five foot, five foot two, and five foot three, which is serial killer uh, candy, mind you. Um, small, easy to manage. Uh, yeah, that is serial killer candy, but it also makes it easy for anybody to manage them more so than an Amazonian style woman, you know, a weightlifter or a boxer, you know, it's like, oh yeah, these, these women did not exactly look like they were tough, tough cookies. Shall we say that? Um, was there an up urgency? Yes. Two weeks she was going to testify. Um, and that, that's one of those things that some, you know, when we look at the issue of did something happen right before this happened? And, and a lot of times you have to look at that because something spurred something. And so that obviously, I'm sure the detective said the same thing. It's like, well, she was about to testify. Um, it doesn't mean that's what happened, but it's interesting. That's why we have girl broke up with boy, girl gets dead. <laughs> Look at boy, you know, it's, it's that, that kind of thing. Husband loses job, um, has a husband, uh, let's say, oh, husband has a, uh, yeah, husband has a new, new girlfriend, um, uh, needs money, lost his job, big, big, uh, big uh, insurance policy on wife that just was changed a month ago. You look at the husband, you know, it doesn't mean it's him, but it does mean it's hard to look away from that as far as motive. So, yeah. And, and even though we say, oh, well, it wasn't going to be a big deal. Do we know that the three of them knew it wasn't going to be a big deal? You know, just because we think so. And we can look back now and say, I see he got probation. Um, Maybe he thought it was a big deal. I didn't want to go to prison. Didn't want to go to jail. It was a felony. It wasn't a misdemeanor. It was a felony. And maybe they're like, hey, well, screw this. You know, we're not going to let her be a witness. Who knows? Because, you know, it doesn't mean you have smart people. And sometimes smart people make really dumb decisions. You know, um, that, that that's a good point, Stephanie. Maybe it feels counterintuitive, but taking them from the home actually might point to a less experienced killer because it is so much more work and more dangerous in terms of possibly getting caught. This is also true. I think it's a very, that's not even, I think it's, that's a great point. We always assume that the killer, the people doing crimes are smart. A lot of times they're not, and they don't take into account consequences. 
And so they do stuff, which is kind of dumb, dumb shit stuff, you know? And then you think, why would you do that? It was, there's easier things to do, but they do it anyway. And the, the amazing thing is some of the dumbest guys get away with some of the worst crimes because sometimes you just get lucky. You get lucky and, and luck wins the day. Um, and bodies have never been found. So is it because they found, you know, because it was a complete stranger who drove out of state and there was no way to trace anything, which is possible, or was, I mean, this is a local little peep, window peeper dude. I mean, did he have a vehicle to get three women and find some place to get rid of them when he was just, a, you know, when he was still peeping the windows? I mean, really, is that, is that the guy? Um, is it these three young men who managed to, I don't know, get any vehicle and have all the night to work and drive a, drive away and dump those women someplace. Doesn't mean they couldn't have gone back later and buried them. You know what I mean? Done a better job. Who knows? This, this is the thing we just don't know. Um, but the bodies haven't been found, so it really screws everything up. Um, no, uh, I would say no on this one. They weren't lured away because they would have taken their purses. That's the thing. The purses were left, so they were definitely kidnapped. They knew they were being kidnapped. This wasn't any lure at all. The only lure I could say is the, the possibility of somebody broke the, the uh, globe on purpose to make a sound. So somebody said, oh, my God, did somebody just crash into something and open the door? That's possible. Um, it's possible the, the globe dropped by accident. It's possible when the person was trying to turn off the light. It's possible they turned off the light and pur purposely broke the globe. It's also possible some think that as the women were being taken out of the house, then there was a there was some attempt to to flee and somebody hit the globe and it broke. Also possible, but no, I don't think they were lured out because they left their purses. I think that's the clue. Um, that uh, you know, people don't. If there somebody's been your your son's been in an accident. First of all, anybody said somebody's been in an accident, you're going to put your pants on. I don't care if you're going. You know, <laughs> you're, I don't see any women running out of the house without pants on, grabbing her purse. There's no phones to grab because they don't have cell phones. But, oh, and uh, speaking of the phone calls, the ones that came in the next day, supposedly these the two times something sounded weird. Well, why would anybody, and, and is this a coincidence that after the women were kidnapped, somebody called twice? Here's my theory on that, because we didn't have the tracing we had back then. I think they were calling to see if anybody had found out the women were gone. I forgot to mention that earlier. I wish I had. Um why would anybody waste their time calling a house? First of all, they have to know the number. They have to know the number. Why would they call the house? Well, they call the house and somebody picks up the phone. It's not the women. They know that the women have been discovered as missing. That might be just some information they wanted to have. They want to know who's, who's the, are the police there? What's going on? They might just be checking things out, but they'd have to know the phone number. Now, a serial killer is not going to waste his time with that. He's going to be gone. But a person who knows them and knows the number might well do that. And that's, I forgot to bring that up earlier. Might be a reason. Now, some people think it's just coincidental, just pervert calls. But pervert calls during the day, right after women week, mm, I find that unlikely. Um, <laughs> very good. An old detective told me they just lie constantly, so probably won't learn too much. Thank God for that, guys. Correct. Um, uh, it's a weak motive. Uh, it does seem to be a weak motive. I agree with you, Alexandra, but it depends whether it's a weak motive in their minds. Because they, apparently they apparently they were really pissed at Susie. Really pissed. To say, after those girls were kidnapped, to say they hoped the bitches were dead is, is pretty nasty. I mean, who says that? So, you know, who knows what kind of guys these were at the time. Um, uh, I... I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I don't know. I, I might've, you know, I don't know if that happened or not. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, stalked, followed to the houses. I don't think so. I don't think they were stalked that night. It's just, it's just, uh, they, 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 I, I, I find that hard. They'd have to be stalked right from the party. Um, I, I, I find that, Unlikely. I do. Um, um, let's see. Um, uh, 
and I agree with this. Um, why that night? I don't know why that night. But again, it's hard to know that for sure for any reason. Uh, and, uh, maybe because time was running around. Maybe because they were available. Maybe because they were out and about. And that could be true for, this, uh, for a, uh, a serial killer as well. Um, some people think there's drugs involved here. and They were kidnapped because of uh, of uh, Cheryl Levitt. Um, she was involved in some big drug thing and they came and kidnapped them. I just don't see that. So it doesn't sound like a drug kind of thing to me makes no sense. But again, why that night? Why that particular point in time? Now, Ken Maines thinks it's because the, 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 the peeping Tom was in the neighborhood peeping and he happened to see them and then he just went with, went with it. He thinks that's the answer. Um, I, I just find that unlikely. Um, I do, but you know, Different, differing opinions, <laughs> differing opinions, because I think if he was just, if he was only a peeping Tom at that point, uh, I think he would have gone for a single person in a house that he would have just entered the house and raped them, um, moving to the next level. He would not go get his vehicle and then kidnap three women. I just, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm late, but glad to be here. I mean, I'm glad you're here, Linda. You're a great teacher and definitely doing good. Thank you. Um, oh, that's very nice. I've learned so much already. Well, this is my, my point to doing the show. I mean, if I, can, if I can't feel that's what I'm doing, it serves, you know, it serves me no purpose to do it. You know, um, I do like analyzing crimes, mind you. So, I mean, I, I find analyzing crimes fascinating. So each time one of you recommends a crime, um, it's interesting to me to then review it and learn from it myself to go back over everything and to see what I think, because I love a puzzle. Um, and it's really interesting. This one, you know, I, I didn't, I was like, oh yeah, I remember this one from 2000, year 2000. And, um, and to think nothing's really changed since the year 2000. It's very sad. Um, sometimes I forget about the crimes I've actually analyzed, even the ones I've actually worked on, <laughs> which I then go, oh, like the Rhonda Hinson case. Um, I forgot how I ran into it. I think I ran into Ken Main's channel. I think I was just scrolling something. I said, oh my God, Rhonda Hinson. And I forgot. Oh my God, I worked that case. <laughs> you know, I did. I worked with a family on the case. Uh, not with the, the department who lost the evidence. So I ended up not going to uh, North Carolina. But I'd worked on the case and I'd come, I had, an, I had a whole you know profile of that case. And why it was so many years ago, you know, you forget over the years what you've actually done and what you haven't. And sometimes I flip through old files because, you know, the files that I used to have, which had, you know, the manila, <laughs> the manila files where you take the uh, uh, m marker and you write the names on. Oh, my God. And there's real papers in there. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, I did this one. You know, <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's like it's like another life, you know, because of so many years. I've been out here a while, a couple, more than two decades. So um, but uh, let's see. Uh, last comments here before I close down for the night. Uh, oh, really? I did not know that. Uh, Lori Vallow, Daybell's trial isn't televised to the chagrin of many true crime channels. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm glad that's not either. I mean, it's not like who done did it. We already know. Um, yes. Um, the clothes were reportedly neatly folded. Well, no and yes. Um, uh, Stacy was staying the night. I don't know that she had anything with her. So she, wearing a t she was just wearing her T-shirt top, I think. You know, a lot of girls do that. You know, go to somebody's house. And what you do is you take, you just take off your, the pants are uncomfortable to sleep in, but most people, you know, keep their, their shirt on, you know? Um, so women do that all the time. They just take off their, their, their shorts and their, and their, um, and their, uh, some, somewhere bras to bed. Some people don't, depending on where you are, um, what, what comfort level you have. Um, so she may, I don't, I don't, can't remember that issue, but clearly she didn't have her shorts on or the shoes. She took those things off and folded them and then got in bed. Um, and the, I don't know, I don't know about the other ones. They probably just wore night clothes. Yeah. I'm sure everybody was abducted and whatever they were wearing. Nobody, nobody got dressed there. Um, <laughs> sadly, um, uh, let's see, uh, had to have been someone else's car. Yes. Um, they, yes, they, they, they weren't lured. So if they were lured, they would have said, give us one minute. Cause it doesn't, you know, if I, if somebody tells me my son's been in an accident, I'm not running out of here naked. 
you know, I'm going to go one minute. I'm going to run in there. I might not put underwear on, actually. I might just throw my shorts on and, and you know, a shirt and throw a coat over myself. I might do that and be half dressed. But I'm going to be dressed enough to walk out the door, get in a car, get out of the car at a hospital or whatever, whatever location I'm going to. I'm not going to run out and, you know, naked. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to and I'm going to grab my probably grab my purse because I'm going to need my ID and my money. And these days, my cell phone. So they weren't lured. They absolutely were kidnapped. There's not a question about that. It's just a question about who and what. You know, um, uh, this is a good point. Uh, do you believe the perpetrator brought their vehicle into the driveway of the house or parked it nearby? I think Ken Mayne's thought, because let's look at, let's look at what Ken's thoughts are on this, because I think this is reasonable. Um, I think he thought that this peeping Tom dude um, parked somewhere around the corner that, uh, okay, let's see, I forgot which, okay, those, uh, okay. So the girls, as he pointed out correctly, the girls pulled in this way because they, this is where they came in. So the girls pull, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Let's look backwards. Hold on a second, something's fishy here. Why does that look backwards? Because wouldn't the carport, something, I want, what the heck? Okay, I'm confused here. That doesn't make any I'm not even sure what I'm looking at here now. I don't even know if that's the same house. Okay, that weird ignore this picture there because it don't make sense to me okay so the girls the girls came in this way which you would if you you know stacy was here i'm sorry uh susie was here uh ken points out she's slightly onto the grass so maybe she was drinking maybe uh, uh stacy behind her here so they they came in oh sorry i got my finger working because i'm on a green screen this way mom's in the gar the carport so there is this area where you see the police cars parked that Somebody could have pulled in here. Let me try. <laughs> you don't know how hard this is. This is backwards, like a mirror image, weird thing. So they're, yeah, they pulled in here. Did they pull in there? Um, and if they were, they would be beside, let's look at the other picture, the front of the house. Um, okay. So if they pulled in to the, in front of that carport right here, could somebody inside see that there's a vehicle in the driveway? The answer to that would be yes. But would they, would it matter? They could pull in. Maybe somebody even heard them pull in and was curious about what's going on. They, the person got out, they turned that light thing, the thing fell or whatever happened. And they looked out the door, opened up the door. And that was that. doesn't matter that the car's there. Uh, if you want to hide, but look, but theoretically, and I say this picture looks backwards to me. I mean, this one, uh, there is a reasonable amount of stuff green around there. Uh, they could be parked on a, let's see, where the hell would they park? Yeah, I, I, I'm not convinced that they park behind the house or someplace else because then you'd have to see the, oh, oh, so, um, oh, I know what I was thinking there. Um, so, so Ken was thinking if they went out the back door, they could be parked on like a street, I think it's like, like a, a door in the fence. They could be herded through the backyard through a door and a fence to a car parked behind the house. But apparently, according to information I have, there were no, everything was locked. Nobody left the house by the back. So they came out the front, which means, in my opinion, you're not going <laughs> to herd these girls, women down the block. You know what I mean? You're going to get them straight into a vehicle. So the vehicle is probably right here. Um, and since the, 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 the house is a little bit of a distance from other houses, I don't think in the dark, somebody pulling in with their vehicle is going to worry about the neighbors because if this is correct, and I'm not sure it is, there's something fishy about that. But anyway, um, the, there's enough distance between the neighbors. There's a business, I think there's a business across the street. I think, yeah, I think there's actually a business across the street and then there's some other business. So this whole area is not, like not really anybody around. So there's no reason why somebody would have to worry if they pulled into this driveway that anybody was seeing their car. So I personally think they pulled it right here um, with a plan of, because if you're pulling the women out of the house, you want to get them into the vehicle as quickly as possible. The last thing you want is to have to hurt them across a long area where somebody can break for it and run. You want to get them right into the vehicle. So I think right there, I, I do think they were the part the car was parked there. Um, let's see.
Um, if he took them with his car, he ran the risk of having DNA evidence in his car. Sure, anybody would. Um, but we're talking 1992. Touch DNA wasn't a thing back then, okay? I know because 1990, we were still in the RFLP stage, which kind of meant you had to have a whole lot of, you had to have a whole lot of something like semen or blood or something like a big pool. I mean, when I say big pool, I mean this much, but you know, enough that you can see it. And then we went to um, PCR, which required way, way less and STR, which then you can multiply things. If they didn't kill the women, in the car if they were only transporting them there may be no dna now today we'd have say touch dna but there may be no dna besides which if you transport them you can always you know then you're transporting them and you can take them out of the vehicle and then you can wash your vehicle down i mean people do that all the time and don't get caught uh, you could steal a vehicle steal the vehicle use it put the vehicle back a lot of people especially youngins they will borrow a vehicle from one of their relatives. It has always amazed me. It's like, hey, uncle, can I borrow your van? I got to move some furniture. And the guy goes, okay. And you borrow the van, you bring it back two days later. The guy doesn't ask any questions. And then the police don't have it necessarily, depending on who it is, who you borrowed it from, and it's a connection to that particular vehicle. And if they wash the vehicle out, then there's no proof of anything. No. Now the theory, theory is somebody saw a van, but we that 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 whole thing is questionable, and and the looks of the van are questionable, and the type of van it is questionable. So <laughs> they don't have a van to prove anything with. Now if they ended up killing the women in the van, it'd be a different matter. So I don't think he, I do not believe he was already in the home, and that makes no sense to me at all. No, absolutely, I do not believe that. I think that one. We I think almost everybody who's examined this crime believes that. He came into the home after they were already all in bed. Um, uh, well, if you if you kill people in their home, if that's what the purpose was, you 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 it's a mess. There, there's evidence there, um, and the neighbors are not that close. I mean, it depends how you kill them. Um, you don't have to make it noisy. Um, but then you have, you know, then you have, then you have to get in your vehicle with maybe blood on you. So that's problematic. Unless you strangle everybody. That's not a big deal. Um, the, the whole point about abduction is where they, I mean, if you're a serial killer, you can also, if you're a serial rapist, you can tie everybody up and rape them in their home and kill them there. And then, you you know, that's, that's not, a, that's very more, much more usual. Or you can, yes, kidnap everybody and then rape and murder them someplace else and, yeah, that's another possibility. Or you you kidnap them for some other reason with a purpose of whatever and never return them. I don't know. We don't know. Um, um, no, she was home. She was she was refurn she was up she was inside refurnishing the furniture. So she was home for a long time with, before those girls arrived at two. She called her friend at 11. She was still just in the house, refer, re, just doing stuff in the house. She was home alone a long time. And I, it just makes no sense if they were after her, they would take the girls. I just, I just find that really hard to believe. Um, so again, Lila, no, because they were wearing clothes. They were not wearing clothes. So no, it wasn't a ruse. Um, she was outside, supposedly. I don't know that she was outside. Yeah, I thought she was inside. Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, Stephanie says, robbing corpses suggests a lack of empathy and a care for social norms at the very least. Yeah, no question about it. There, 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 there's this level of certain behavior and certain teens. I see this with West Memphis 3, so I know a lot of people think of West Memphis 3 innocent, but I do not. And they say, well, they, they weren't necessarily Satanists. They were, you know, they were just, you know, just because they were black. That's not the problem. That the, you know, um, the problem was all of their behaviors, especially the, the main one. Um, uh, uh, what's his face? Um, <laughs> I forgot his name now. Um, dang, how can I forget his name? Uh, 
main, main guy for uh, West Memphis three. Um, Jeez, I'm just I'm blanking. Um, he had a history of all kinds of very very sick thinking, very sick thinking, um, very violent thinking, very uh, just very dark thoughts. Okay, doesn't mean he and he did dabble in the reading of satanic stuff, but that doesn't mean that that, that, that it's. It's the problem is it's problematic thinking. There are certainly kids who like experiment and stuff and get all gothy and all that. But when you get to the level of what he, I don't know, somebody give me his name because I'm just, I'm just, um, come on, somebody, so throw me his name. <laughs> Damien, Damien Eccles. <laughs> I just went out in my head. Dame, I was saying one of those satanic names, uh, Damien, Damien Eccles. Um, he, he, not so much, he very much had that. Then he had his best buddy who, Kind of went along with that thinking. Then we had this the extra fellow, in my opinion. I'm not going to go into the whole case. You can watch my thing on the West Memphis Three. So, but we have dark thinking, and I don't mean dark thinking by satanic. I just mean against society's uh, mores, against just the, the the beauty of life is not there. That the person gets really into just like like the people like the kid who just recently killed the girl because he said i want to feel like what it was like killing somebody and he stabs her over 100 times the guy he just killed the cheerleader and and there's been women who've done the same teenage girls who said the same thing i just want to feel what it was like to kill somebody stab 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 this is very dark thinking this is not healthy normal thinking so when you have somebody going down a path where they choose to do things which are really rather despicable you have to wonder what the rest of their brain is doing and what they're willing to do. Um, so robbing graves, breaking the mausoleums, grabbing somebody's skull out of the mausoleum, taking his teeth out, and then going and selling it is not what I call normal teenage behavior. <laughs> this is something that something is not quite right with this person. Now, could that person turn out okay, as some have claimed? Maybe, maybe it was a phase, but it's pretty creepy. Now, maybe that person even looked back and said, my God, I was a creep. And I was a really creepy dude. Thank God I've found a better way to live. But if I had a son who was breaking into mausoleums and robbing, uh, take, ripping people's uh, <laughs> skull, taking skulls and taking their teeth out of the skull, I would be concerned about what kind of human being he was. I really would be very, very concerned. Um, yeah, that's exactly not normal teenage mischief. Maybe, maybe toilet papering a tree. Uh, that's about as far as I can go with that. <laughs> it's about time for me to leave too. <laughs> bye, bye, Kelly. <laughs> um, uh, the York Yorkie was named. There was a little Yorkie named Cinnamon. He was not left in the yard. He was in the house just yapping away. He wasn't tied up or putting out room or anything. He's just a little thing yapping away. Um, that's all. Um, yeah. Uh, this is very true. Um, Hollywood makes people think killers are all geniuses with elaborate plots, but usually stupid motives, dumb luck, and psychopathy. Good. That's a good end for my show. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Usually it's stupid motives, dumb luck, and psychopathy. You, you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> I think you profiled a good good number of, of, of killers, not just serial killers, but just killers in general. That's the way it is. I mean, if they had good motives and were intelligent and didn't have psychopathy, they wouldn't probably do what they did. But most of them get, a lot of them get caught because they aren't that bright and they do have dumb motives and they, 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 they do dumb shit and they get caught. And then there's the ones who get luckier. Um, and maybe they do have a little more skill from repeating things like serial killers sometimes get pretty good in the middle of things, but yeah, a lot of times it's just that combination of three things and and they get away with it. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna, on that, I'll end the show. <laughs> I'm glad you're over here. There'll be a hangout uh, during the week uh, where we'll be discussing whatever cases are around and whatever the news is. And um, so, but this was a fun case to look back on after all these years, but I wish they'd find the three women. And, you know, there's one of those cases where, you know, I spent talking to Stacy's mom and you know, it's, it's always hard when you talk to the families of the victims because, you know, just her, her daughter goes out for a night and she just vanishes and that's it. They have no answers. 
And they've been, they're still waiting for those answers all these years. That's all these years later. It's 92. So, yeah, what is it? Is it 30 years now? Yeah, it's 30 years now. So three decades. Unbelievable and very sad. So anyway, thank you for being here. If you're new to the channel, do like and subscribe and show up for more of my, uh, for more of my videos. Bye.